The Greek national opera is a national treasure. For years, the opera has produced work of the highest quality, including original works by Greek artists, building on a long history of support to the GNO, including the creation of its new home here at the SNFCC. SNF announced this year a 20 million euro grant to help plug the GNO into the international open com opera community and help it find the global stage work merits. George Kumentakis, the GNO's artistic director, is here to tell us more. George? Να μιλήσουμε και λίγο ελληνικά σήμερα. Καλύτερα έτσι. Θέλω να ξεκινήσουμε πρώτα απ' όλα και να μας πεις τι ήταν αυτό το οποίο παρακολουθήσαμε πριν από λίγα λεπτά. Ήταν μια άρια που λέγεται «Je veux vivre», θέλω να ζήσω, «Je veux vivre», from Romeo and Juliet, Βασιλική Καραγιάννη, was the soprano, and the pianist. A while ago, uh, we also watched the video along with other amazing things, which was really impressive because we saw many productions of the National Opera and we have also seen many numbers. Uh, the public does know what the Greek National Opera is doing. We know many parallel sectors in which it is active. We know many performances and presentations by GNO, and this is a great new home of the GNO. On your side, what, what is the current stage for you, the current phase? Uh, let me start with uh, the Greek National Opera, uh, how it was in the past, how it used to be, because you know it has a very long journey of 80 years. We are celebrating our 80th anniversary next year. And it has been an upward trend, uh, an upward journey, which uh, at a certain point, I think, uh, has uh, entrapped its power and its potential, because Olympia Theatre was a very old theatre, a small one of old technology that did not allow us to develop our repertoire. So we needed uh, uh, some new space uh, to house our dreams and uh, um, grow our potential. Uh, a place that would be similar to the places of uh, major uh, national operas abroad. And uh, Stavros Niarchos Foundation came at that moment and offered this amazing theater in uh, uh, Stavros Niarchos uh, Foundation. And it, this is uh, where the new era of GNO started. In a couple of years, uh, in these uh, two years, uh, the development of our activities on both uh, stages, uh, Stavros Niarchos uh, room and uh, the alternative stage, which is next door. So the development has been rapid. Uh, first of all, we've had excellent productions, excellent quality productions. Uh, we have also broadened, enlarged uh, our repertoire, which uh, could not be done a few years ago. We had hundreds of participations uh, from Greek and foreign artists. There has been uh, an exponential increase in the number of tickets and sponsorships. There has been a major and important uh, development of co-productions uh, with uh, uh, foreign national operas. There has been a major cultural and educational contribution because, as you know, we have uh, learning and participation programs that are very rich. So since uh, we do have a sense of uh, our national mission, uh, our mandate, but we also have, uh, are fully aware of public interest, the entire organization is uh, working hard and it's doing its best uh, to uh, gain uh, the lost ground. And we want to establish Greek National Opera as an equal uh, European uh, opera as a European theatre. Uh, uh, okay, and now I'm curious uh, to find out what is going to follow, because uh, a while ago I said something that uh, b came out last January, the announcement of uh, the new major donation uh, to Greek National Opera from Stavros Niarchos Foundation. Yes, 20 million, which, which is the new grant, the new donation. And this is the continuation or the crowning, if you wish, of uh, the previous uh, two uh, grants we should not forget. Uh, and they come at a moment when uh, national opera in Greece really needs it because uh, it needs to go abroad. It needs 
it needs to travel abroad. It has proven its value, and it has to cross the borders and uh, uh, communicate its uh, work uh, all over the world, in every corner of the world. So Stavros Niarchos Foundation and Andreas Drakopoulos, uh, the president, are offering this major uh, gift uh, to music, uh, um, musical uh, theater and uh, uh, drama theater, uh, to partnership of arts, collaboration of arts for, the, for all of us uh, who love art and uh, serve culture. I, I, I wish uh, to make a special mention uh, to the dedication for 200 years from the Greek Revolution that will take place in 2021 in uh, all premises, all facilities in both theatres, but also outside uh, Greece. And uh, the main goal of uh, uh, this event is uh, uh, to read uh, the Greek uh, liberation war, the Greek revolution, not just as a local, but also a, as a historical event of uh, a global range, uh, worldwide range. Because uh, we do not own the one and only historical truth, so uh, we are not going to have uh, flags and hymns, uh, but open journeys with uh, artists and creators that will uh, uh, speak the voice outside the stereotypes. Uh, so these uh, four years of the new uh, grant, the new donation, the Greek National Opera will work hard uh, to prove its value. We want uh, to show uh, that we can move uh, the worldwide public uh, with our ideas and our production. We have to prove that uh, we are ready to open up our wings into the future, uh, Mr. Drakopoulos, so that uh, uh, we can prove that you, we do deserve your trust. Thank you. We thank you very much, and we are looking forward. Thank you for having me here. This is much. Oscar Eustis, Artistic Director of the Public Theatre. Thank you. I am Nia you know Vardalis. Nia. <laughs> I am Nia Vardalis. Thank you very much for having us. Mr. Dracopoulos, and we would like to talk about theater and democracy in the birthplace of civilization. And according to my dad, it all started here in Greece. And for those of you from other countries, sorry. <laughs> and uh, we appreciate you for your contributions as well. I'm going to ask Oscar Eustace a question. Is this microphone okay like this? Oscar, you said something this morning, and for those of you who were not here this morning, I'm going to tell you what it was, and that is that Hamilton, which became a cultural phenomenon, a play, a musical, that now has many touring productions, that Hamilton could be out of reach to many who could not afford a ticket about the founding of America. But what Oscar did, which is what attracted me to the public theater, is Oscar and the creators of Hamilton put together a lottery and what it is is that you can every day sign up and try to get not the $200 ticket that very few can afford, not the $2,000 ticket that very few can afford, but the $10 ticket. Please tell us why you did that, Oscar. Well, the, the idea is simple. That, um, there's a contradiction, right, between what the public theater stands for, which is a theater that's supposed to be for everybody, and what happens when we enter into the commercial arena where market principles take over. So the question is always, what do we do to, to create a 
dynamic tension between the market and accessibility. So the lottery was a huge part of that. And the other thing that I'm terribly proud of is what we call the Eduham program, which is that every year in New York, in Chicago, and now in San Francisco, 20,000 high school kids from the least economically privileged schools in the city get to come not only see Hamilton for $10, but, and William, if you're here, this is very much to your point about um, uh, taking art to the people. They actually spend a period of time creating their own pieces, usually rap pieces, but sometimes other kinds of pieces about American history. And on the day they come to the theater, they spend the morning performing those on stage for the cast of Hamilton before they watch Hamilton do Hamilton. And it's one of the most brilliant interactive access programs that I've ever participated in. Oscar said something a long time ago that affected me, and it is that theater is for everyone. And that is completely apparent today with this festival that is free. We can all see it. We can all learn from each other. And when you said that, why did you say that, Oscar? Well, it's simple. I, it, you know, uh, it was referenced in my panel that theater and democracy began here in Athens. It actually began in the same decade here in Athens, which leads us to believe that either the theater created democracy, democracy created the theater, or they created each other. But that basic idea that's in the theater, the idea that what you need is dialogue between two different points of view in order to create the truth, is the same idea that's inherent in democracy. If you don't believe that the truth comes from the dialogue between different points of view, you don't really believe in democracy. You really wish you could be in charge and you're just putting up with democracy. But true Democrats, with a small d, believe that that process of theater making, of playing a scene, of opposing viewpoints, is what makes for great politics as well as great art. What you also have to do is the theater trains you, again a word that's come up a number of times here, in empathy, in imagining what it feels like to be somebody else. And that was also our oldest extant text, 472 BC, the Persians, was not based on any of the myths, it was based on the experience of the Persian invasion of uh, Greece, which had happened only eight years before the Persians was produced. And the Persians was about that great Greek victory from the Persian point of view. And it was saying to its audience, yes, we won, but imagine what it felt like to lose that war. And by the way, look at who else was sure they were gonna win all the time. They were sure that God was on their side. They were sure that their state would last forever. So he was asking the Greeks not only to empathize with the Persians, but also to imagine the fallibility of human beings together. And, and again, that all that all was created exactly where your dad said it was created, yeah. right? Here. And and having traveled to other countries as well, been to Japan and Italy and Turkey and going to parts of Africa, I'm always amazed at the contributions that have come from every country and every walk of life in going back and looking at our own history. I believe that we have a cultural responsibility to go back and talk about our stories, what we have to say. The one undervalued place, uh, I mean, um, cultural issue I find in America and Canada is the indigenous population and Australia. I met someone, Dimitri, here, who, by the way, we found out were cousins. <laughs> from Australia uh, and there is an undervalued population and another thing that the public does at the theater is they give scholarships and also the Stavros Niarchos Foundation, thank you very much, for giving scholarships to find other stories, to find other voices. How important do you think that is? Well, I, th I think it's crucial. Um, the, the, the beautiful thing about democracy is that it can never be fulfilled, right? there's always room for greater enfranchisement. There's always room for greater inclusion. Politically, we're at a place in the Western world, certainly right now, where that feels very much in question, where it feels like we, we have a choice to make. We are either gonna recommit to the values of inclusion and enfranchisement, or we're going to go in a very different, much darker direction. So 
what I think our job is in the theater is to make our small but meaningful contribution to making everybody's story be part of the bigger story. Everybody be the subjects of history, not the objects of history. How important is it for you? I, I, I know it is the mandate of the public theater, but why is it so important for you to create new works of theater at the public theater in New York? The theater is always a place where people take center stage and get to say, this is my story. I'm not part of just anybody else's story. I'm telling my own story. And that ability to do that, I think the theater has always had a crucial role in doing that. In, in our own country, what August Wilson did with his African-American cycle of Pittsburgh plays, what Eugene O'Neill did with the Irish, we forget that, but he was representing the Irish. And what you have done <laughs> with your heritage, Nia, is just unbelievable. And I have to say, we are here primarily because I was lucky enough to get to help Nia make this brilliant play that she wrote and starred in called Tiny Beautiful Things. Well, thank you. First, I owe everyone an, everyone an apology. Why I have not made a movie in the last three years is because <laughs> I chose to feed my soul by going back to the theater, and I was welcomed by Oscar Eustace to the public theater. Uh, it was the most enriching experience of my life in that I was handed a book by the director of Hamilton, Thomas Kale, who directed, uh, subsequently directed my play, Tiny Beautiful Things. He handed me a book called Tiny Beautiful Things, written by Cheryl Strayed. Cheryl wrote the book Wild, her memoir. In Tiny Beautiful Things, what she did the year or two before Wild came out is that Cheryl was an online anonymous advice columnist. Nobody knew her name. And that is not the reason she took the job. She didn't write, take the job because it would give her freedom to write from a place of privacy. She felt that it would give the reader freedom to read the words so that the words could be the salve for their souls, but they would be unencumbered by who Cheryl was. Well, reading the book, I was attracted to what Cheryl Strayed calls radical empathy. Her advice giving was illuminating rather than instructional. You know how everyone has that aunt who says, or that mom or that dad who says, you should, you should go to college and be a lawyer. You should marry Bill next door, even though we're related to him. <laughs> like that. Well, so I don't like advice. <laughs> I don't like, you should have bangs. You know, I don't like it. But what I loved about Cheryl's book is that it showed me a path. It gave me permission to grieve things in my past and also move forward. And it was dark material. I was attracted to a person's life that I had never played before with huge, huge permission from the public theater. I got to adapt this book. We did the play. I wrote the play for free, which is where all good things come from. <laughs> Never go any, after anything for the pursuit of money. I got to perform the play over a period of three years. My daughter is here today. She's 13 years old. She traveled back and forth to New York from Los Angeles, and I traveled back and forth so I could be a mother and a playwright and an actor. And why we did it was to feed our souls. Subsequently, what happened is it became the New York Times critic's pick, the play has been published. It's in 25 theaters across the U.S. and can soon Canada, Mexico, Uruguay, and Argentina. And again, why is because there's something so healing about this woman's words. I'm going to ask Oscar a question. Who gave you the book, and when did you get Tiny Beautiful Things? I, Thomas Kale gave me the book, too, and it was while we were in a preview for Hamilton, and I will never forget it. He just handed me this book in the aisle and said, you should read this. <laughs> and I read it, and like you, I fell in love with Cheryl's voice and immediately passed it off to my daughter, who immediately, actually, while I was passing it off to my daughter in a restaurant, the waiter looked down and said, oh, is that Tiny Beautiful Things? I love that book. It's like a private hand-to-hand -hand gift. And I would just say, Nia, that, that what you described about Cheryl's voice is exactly right. This woman managed to make a play out of an anonymous internet advice column. <laughs> Not the most, you know, 
easiest thing to do. But what I think allowed Nia into it is that Cheryl discovered that actually by being self-revealing about herself, she could be most empathic with other people. And we're going to be, I'm, I'm honored enough to read with Nia, a section from Tiny Beautiful Things that will just give you a, a taste of her voice. Yeah. The letters are real. The letters were written by people seeking advice to Cheryl Strayed, who was writing under the name Sugar. So the letters start with Dear Sugar, and Cheryl Strayed signed them off as Sugar. And this letter that we're going to read for you was written by a man. We'll never know who he is, but this letter is in the book and in the play, and it is called The Obliterated Place. And I should also just say that Nia structured this play beautifully. So in a way, one of the ways the through line of the play worked was that there were increasing challenges to Cheryl. Can you actually respond to this? Can you empathize with this? How can you be helpful with this? And the obliterated place was in some ways the climax of that difficulty. Yes, Cheryl Strait had lost her mother when, her, when Cheryl was 22 years old and in various ways had tried to deal with it. She's very candid in the book. She turned to heroin use. She, uh, was, she committed adultery. She went through an abortion and a divorce and she went through many, many, many things of which she is entirely grateful because they made her who she is. This letter writer reaches out to Cheryl Strayed. And he says, Dear Sugar, one, it's taken me many weeks to compose this letter and still I can't do it right. The only way I can get it out is to make a list instead of write a letter. Two, I don't have a definite question for you. I'm a sad, angry man whose son died. I want him back. That's all I ask for and it's not a question. Three, Nearly four years ago, a drunk driver drove through a red light and hit my son at full speed. The dear boy I loved more than life itself was dead before the paramedics even got to him. He was 22, my only child. Four, I'm a father while not being a father. Most days it feels like my grief is going to kill me, or maybe it already has. I'm a living dead dad. Five, your column has helped me go on. I have faith in my version of God and I pray every day. And the way I feel when I'm in my deepest prayer is the way I feel when I read your words. Six, I see a psychologist regularly and I'm not clinically depressed or on medication. Seven, suicide has occurred to me but I can't do it because it would be a betrayal of my values and also of the values I instilled in my son. Eight, I have good friends and family who are supportive and even my ex-wife and I have become close friends again since our son's death. Nine, I have a good job and my health. Ten, I'm going on in a way that makes it appear as if I'm adjusting to life without my son. But the fact is I'm living in a private hell. 11. Sometimes the pain is so great, I simply lie in my bed and wail. 12. I can't stop thinking about my son. 13. I can't stop thinking about the things my son would be doing now if he were alive, and also the things I did with him when he was young. 14. I hate the man who killed my son. For his crime, he was incarcerated 18 months, then released. He wrote me a letter of apology, but I barely scanned it. I ripped it into pieces and threw it in the garbage. 15. I fear you will choose not to answer my letter because you haven't lost a child. 16. I fear if you choose to answer my letter, people will make critical comments about you, saying you don't have the right to speak to this matter because you have not lost a child. 17. I pray you will never lose a child. 18. 
I will understand if you choose not to answer my letter. Most people, kind as they are, don't know what to say to me. So why should you? 19. I'm writing to you because the way you've written about your grief over your mother dying so young has been meaningful to me. 20. What can you say to me? 21. How do I go on? 22. How do I become human again? Signed, Living Dead Dad. Dear Living Dead Dad, one, I don't know how you go on without your son. I only know that you do, and you have, and you will. Two, your shattering letter is proof of that. Three, you don't need me to tell you how to be human again. You are there in all of your humanity, shining unimpeachably before every person reading these words right now. Four, I am so sorry for your loss. I am so sorry for your loss. I am so sorry for your loss. Five, you could stitch together a quilt with all the times that that has been and will be said to you. You could make a river of consolation words but they won't bring your son back. They won't keep that man from getting into his car and careening through that red light at the precise moment your son was in his path. Six, you'll never keep that man from getting into that car. Seven, when you peel back the rage and you peel back the thoughts of suicide and you peel back the man that got into the car, at the center of that, there is your pure father love, which is stronger than anything. Eight, no one can touch that love or alter it or take it away from you. Your love for your son belongs only to you. Nine, small things have saved me. How much I love my mother, even after all these years. How powerfully I carry her within me. My grief is tremendous, but my love is bigger. So is yours. You're not grieving your son's death because his death was ugly and unfair. You're grieving it because you loved him truly. The beauty in that is greater than the bitterness of his death. Ten, I keep imagining you lying in your bed wailing. I keep thinking that as hard as it is to do, it is time to lift your head from that bed and listen to what's there in the wake of your wail. Eleven, it's your life. The one you must make in the obliterated place that's now your world, where everything you used to be is simultaneously erased and omnipresent, where you are forevermore a living, dead dad. Twelve, a literal translation of the word obliterate means to be against the letters. It was impossible for you to write me a letter, so you made me a list instead. Thirteen, the obliterated place is equal parts destruction and creation. The obliterated place is pitch black and it is bright light. It is water and parched earth, it is mud and it is manna. And the work of deep grief is making a home there. 14, more will be revealed. Your son hasn't yet taught you everything he has to teach you. He taught you how to love like you've never loved before. He taught you how to suffer. <sighs> like you've never suffered before. Perhaps the next thing he has to teach you is acceptance. And the thing after that, forgiveness. Fifteen, forgiveness bellows from the bottom of the canoe. There are stories you'll learn if you're strong enough to travel there. One of them might cure you. Sixteen, we say, I can't go on, instead of saying, we hope we won't have to. But you have the power to withstand this sorrow. We all do. Seventeen, you go on by doing the best you can. You go on by being generous. You go on by offering comfort to others who can't go on. You go on by allowing the unbearable days to pass and allowing the pleasure in other days 
you go on by finding a channel for your rage and another for your love. 18, when my son was six, he said, people die at all ages. He said it without fear or anguish. It has been healing to me to accept in a very simple way that my mother's life was 45 years long, that there was nothing beyond that. 19, when you say you experience my writing is sacred, what you are touching is the place within me that is my mother. Being sugar is the temple I built in my obliterated place. I'd give it all back. But the fact is, my grief taught me things. It required me to suffer. It compelled me to reach. 20, your grief taught you too, living dead dad. Your son was your greatest gift in your life, and he is your greatest gift in his death too. Receive it. Let your dead boy be your most profound revelation. 21, think. My son's life was 22 years long. Breathe in. 22. Think. My son's life was 22 years long. Breathe out. 23. There is no 23. 24. Create something of him. Make it beautiful. Yours, sugar. Oh. Now you should see how that works with a real actor. It's much better. <laughs> but what we tried to do in creating this piece of theater was create a role that could be played by a woman, not bound by age or ethnicity or achievements, much in the same way Cheryl Strayed wanted her writing to go on. I have had the pleasure of seeing this role that I played for three years, played by a woman who's African American, younger than me, in San Diego. It was incredible. In Portland, the woman is Asian. No, again, the ethnicity doesn't matter, but it goes on and on and on, as theater should. And you know, what I think Nia captured so beautifully in this piece is it's a wonderful play, but also I hope you could get a feel. It's also an event that happens in the room with the audience. And, you know, not, I mean, you know, yes, it's, it's having 20 productions. I also have to say, we ran it in a sold-out production at the Public Theater and had to bring it back the next year into our largest space and run it for another five months. It was incredibly infectious, the community of people who responded to the work, and that's really due to your extraordinary sensitivity with the material. Thank you, Oscar. I think that um, theater does not need an advertising budget. Because if something is affecting, people go and tell their friends. What we call that, in, well, it's tell a Greek, tell a friend, you know, telephone. And it really works to, for people to go on and on. And I think that that's, again, the book was passed on and people passed on this book. Does anybody have any questions for us? We have four minutes left. <laughs> we actually, we only have two because I'm going to ask you to do that last piece. Okay. That's okay. All right. Does anybody have any questions for us? Nothing at all? Do we see? No, there's, they really have no questions. No questions oh, there's at one all? right here. What's that? Is it? Yes, please. Democracy. Yes. democracy came from Greece through the theater. Yes. And how can you see in those days, nowadays with the digital technology, with all these new things, can this theater can be revived? And through all these things, you try to do it through, because the theater is very big power. It's life. And yes. this is what you, can, you try to show. How can you see that can be transformed into, the, into this new era? and create this new civilization and brings that 
to this digital uh, era through this uh, uh, new technology and uh, the theaters which can be live and as well through the digital technology. How can you combine this democracy through the theater and through this new technology you have because it's part of our life. Yes. Well, this is my important, this is what I'm, I'm worried about. I believe in the same way that democracy worked with the casting of votes. We must go to theater. Those of us who can afford and pay for a ticket, we must support the theater with our ticket buying. That is the way that we are voting. We will see more theater if we vote for it, what's playing currently. We must support the arts. I agree with you. Theater, vote, is the ticket is the vote. The ticket so, is the vote. the vote, yes. That's a great slogan. Thank you. The <laughs> um, ticket is the vote, yeah. So, Nia, I'm going to ask you to read the last uh, piece of Tiny Beautiful Things for the audience. Okay. I think it, it's okay. appropriate. Um, this is a piece that Cheryl, this is a story uh, that Ch Cheryl Stray told about her mother. Uh, one of the things that she talks about, that Cheryl Stray talks about, is how, in life, we do not know how something will turn out. We cannot possibly know how something will turn out. I personally know this in, I was in the biological pursuit of a child for 13 years, and the most beautiful thing happened to me that I thank God I got to adopt my daughter. I thank God, but at the time, I did not know how things would turn out. And that is why I was attracted to this piece in the book, and I put it in the play. The summer I was 18, I was driving down a country road with my mother when we stopped at a yard sale. There was nothing much of interest at the sale, but a moment before I was about to suggest we leave, something caught my eye. A red velvet dress trimmed with white lace, fit for a toddler. I was pretty certain at that moment that I would never be a mother myself. Children were fine, but ultimately annoying. I wanted more out of life. And yet, ridiculously, inexplicably, I wanted that red dress. Something about it called powerfully to me. My mother picked it up. She said, you want that red dress for someday? I said, well, I'm not going to have kids. And she said, well, you can put it in a box for someday. And I said, well, I don't even have a dollar. And she said, I do. Three years later, I'd be standing in a field not far from that yard sale, holding the ashes of my mother's body in my palms. My mother was gone. The red dress was still with me, packed into a cedar box that had once belonged to her. I dragged it with me all along the scorching trail of my 20s and into my 30s, when I had two children, a son and then a daughter. The red dress was a secret known only by me, buried for years amongst my mother's best things. And when I unearthed it and held it again, it was like being slapped and kissed at the same time. Like the volume was being turned way up, but also way down. The two things that were true about its existence had an opposite effect and yet were the same single fact. My mother bought a dress for the granddaughter she'll never know. My mother bought a dress for the granddaughter she'll never know. How beautiful, how ugly, how little, how big, how painful, how sweet. It's seldom that we can draw a direct line between this and that. My desire to buy the dress was made meaningful only by my mother's death and by my daughter's birth. The dress was the material evidence of my loss, but also of the way my mother's love had carried me forth beyond her, her life extending years into my own in ways I never could have imagined. In the moment, the red dress caught my eye. And seeing my daughter on the second Christmas of her life, wearing the dress the grandmother she'd never meet bought for her, well, it returned something to me I thought had been lost forever. We cannot possibly know what will manifest in our lives. We live and have experiences and leave people we love and get left by them. People we thought would be with us forever aren't, and people we didn't know would come into our lives do. Our work here is to keep faith with that, to put it in a box and wait, to trust that someday we will know what it means so that when the ordinary miraculous is revealed to us, we will be there 
standing before the baby girl in the pretty dress, grateful for the smallest things. Yours, Sugar. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. SNF helps to counter the unprecedented challenges facing journalism and journalists worldwide through a number of journalism-related initiatives. Several multi-year SNF grants help address these challenges by incubating talented professionals around the world, focusing on creating a pool of professional talent with specialized journalistic expertise. One such attempt to help address the crisis in journalism is IMED the incubator for media education and development. IMED offers resources and expertise in support of journalistic excellence. Through IMED's Idea Zones, students and professionals exchange ideas via three-month thematic sessions with experienced journalists from Greece and abroad. The IMED incubator hosts individuals and organizations with innovative ideas for the creation of new entities or the implementation of innovative projects and offer the necessary knowledge, strategic guidance, networking opportunities and equipment to help them come to life. Γεια σας από τις Βρυξέλλες. Ονομάζομαι Θεοδωρής Ανδρόγενος. Είμαι δημοσιογράφος και βρίσκομαι σε ένα πάρκο κοντά στην πλατεία Πλάζ Ζουρτάν της πόλης για τα γυρίσματα ενός δοκιματέρ μεγάλου μήκους με την υποστήριξη του IMED. Λέγομαι Μυρτώ Παπαδοπούλου, είμαι φωτογράφος δημιουργός δοκιματέρ και αυτή τη στιγμή βρίσκομαι στη Θράκη, στα Πομακοχώρια. Δουλεύω πάνω σε ένα φωτογραφικό project το οποίο αφορά τον πληθυσμό αυτό, αλλά μέσα από τα μάτια της γυναίκας. Με λένε Γιάννη Κολεσίδη, πρόκειται να ταξιδέψω στα ελληνικά ακριτικά νησιά με σκοπό να καταγράψω τη ζωή των κατοίκων κατά τη διάρκεια του χειμώνα και όλα αυτά με τη βοήθεια και την υποστήριξη του IMED. Τι είναι το IMED? Ένα πολύ ωραίο χώρο. <laughs> Δεν είναι απλά ένα ωραίο χώρο. Να του πω πιο απλά. Είναι ένα χώρο όπου βρίσκονται κάποιοι άνθρωποι οι οποίοι σκίζονται για σένα για να καταφέρει αυτό που έχει βάλει στο μυαλό σου σαν στόχο. Είναι ένα διεθνέ δίκτυο επαγγελματιών του τύπου. Δεν είναι έστω στρεφέ. Δεν είναι εταιρεία παραγωγή. Δεν είναι μέσο ενημέρωση. Είναι κόμβο ανταλλαγή ιδεών. Είναι δημοσιογραφικό οργανισμό. I think journalism needs institutions like IMED to support journalists through a very difficult time. I was telling Anna the Wall Street Journal had a deep investigative piece and it said that in the United States, within three to five years, almost every newspaper could be out of business. That's how desperate it is. Πρέπει να δεχτούμε αυτή την αγορά πως είναι, να δούμε τις πραγματικότητες και να δούμε πού μπορείς να γυρίσεις τους κατάλληλους διακόπτες ώστε να πετύχεις το καλύτερο αποτέλεσμα από αυτό που επιδιώκεις. Είναι νομίζω υποχρέωση των μίδια σαν ένας πυλώνας της δημοκρατίας να βοηθήσει ώστε να χαμηλώσουν οι τόνοι. And in order to take journalism to the next level, to rethink it, to reframe it, you need women's voices. If we treat these young women like Human beings number one and professionals number two. The sky's the limit. What they can do. Το IMED δεν είναι εκπαιδευτικός οργανισμός. Ούτε θέλει να είναι. Το IMED είναι μια πρόκληση πρώτα απ' όλα και για το πανεπιστήμιο. Δεν είναι δηλαδή χώρος δηλαδή εκπαίδευσης, αλλά ένας χώρος ανάπτυξης. Για τους νέους δημοσιογράφους, το IMED είναι ο χώρος που έλειπε. 
ενδιάμεσος χώρος μεταξύ του Πανεπιστημίου και των ΜΜΕ. Ένα σημείο συνάντησης, αλλά και το κυριότερο ενημέρωσης από τους κορυφαίους του είδους. Είναι ένας κύκλος συζητήσεων, πάρα πολύ παραγωγικός, τόσο για εμάς τους φοιτητές δημοσιογραφίας, όσο και για τους επαγγελματίες. Και δημιουργείται έτσι ένας πυρήνας αλληλεπίδρασης ανάμεσά μας. I do believe that the future of journalism is collaborative. We can find the signals and the noise, and the signals and the noise is the data, all kinds of data that exists everywhere, that is instantly a reality check on whatever assumptions we're encountering. Δεν ξέρω αν έχετε ακούσει εσείς κάποιον που να λέει ότι είναι fact checker. And we might need to look outside of the mainstream media institutions to be able to do the kind of innovative work and to experiment with new forms. Το IMED δεν είναι μόνο η τεχνολογία. Το IMED είναι οι άνθρωποι. 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 Νομίζω λοιπόν ότι το IMED είναι ο καταλήτης που θα επιτρέψει στο να συνεξελιχθούν δημοσιογράφοι μέσα και σπουδές επικοινωνίας μαζί σε αυτό που αναζητούμε. Νέα μοντέλα και νέες απαντήσεις στα, στα προβλήματα. Το IMED είναι ένα πείραμα. I'm apparently the understudy for Oscar Eustace. Okay, uh, thank you all for coming. Um, and thank you to Nia and Oscar for that um, powerful exchange uh, and so vulnerable in what they revealed. And if you've been here since this morning, um, have, you, have you noticed that there are themes around empathy and forgiveness coming up and how we struggle with it and how important it is to how we treat each other and how we act in humanity. And so we're humbly going to try to discuss in a short period of time um, what are ways that you can approach empathy and forgiveness so that maybe um, this can aid you in your life or your work. Um, we're going to approach this panel a little differently than the other sessions have done, we hope, um, in that we want it to be more interactive. So I want to encourage you at the beginning to submit questions um, because uh, to exemplify empathy, we empathize with being in your seats and wanting to engage and ask questions. And what about this? Um, so we want to encourage you from the beginning to pose that, and I'll do as best I can. So please forgive me for looking down a lot more than I would ordinarily as a moderator. The way we're going to start is just we're going to take just 30 seconds each just to give you some context of the perspective that we each bring so you can understand how we come to be here. And then I'm just going to ask them four or five questions total, just two to three minutes from each of them. If they go too long, I'm going to cut it to four questions, and then um, we're going to turn to you and see what comes. Uh, so please, as you think back on today and as what you're struggling with in life, we'll do as best we can. We're not sugar, but we will do as best we can to try to address it. Um, so to model the 30 seconds, I am Jim Potofsky. I'm with the John Templeton Foundation, and uh, the reason that I'm associated with this is uh, one of the many areas in which we fund around the world is around empathy and forgiveness both around research, but also in public engagement and trying to change behavior in regard to those and, and 40, about 40 other virtues around curiosity, love, humility, and others. Um, so that's why I'm here. And I'm Jane Golden, and I'm the executive director of the Mural Arts Program in Philadelphia. And we have well over 4,500 works of art that grace the sides of buildings throughout Philly. We also see art as something that can be useful, so we're aspirational and highly pragmatic. We have programs for about 25,000 constituents, and the themes of empathy and forgiveness resonate in a lot of our work as we work with people struggling with opioids and heroin. We work in prisons with crime victims. We work with the refugee population, and on and on. But over and over again, we get to see the wonderful um, power of art. 
I'm Brian Dorries. I'm the Artistic Director of Theatre of War Productions. Um, we're a New York City-based social impact theatre company that uses performances of plays, many of them classical Greek plays, but also contemporary, um, as a catalyst for powerful discussions about difficult subjects. And our performances culminate in discussions that last longer than the so-called performances because the true performance is in the audience, especially the audience with skin in the game with regard to the issues we've come to address. We have 25 projects and over the last 10 years, uh, we've delivered over a thousand performances like that all over the world. Um, hi, I'm Mike Wishney. I am a civil rights lawyer and a law professor at Yale Law School. Uh, I teach primarily, primarily in a clinical setting, meaning I supervise law students representing poor and subordinated individuals and communities uh, in court, before the legislature, and so forth. You met one of my students earlier today, Becca Heller, um, and so perhaps you can empathize with me and the challenge of keeping up with these bright, uh, fierce young people. So the first question is to Jane. Um, how can people, can people actually change in regard to forgiveness and empathy? And if so, how can they? Well, I'm somebody who is an optimist as it relates to this because over the 30 years that we've been involved in this work, we have seen people change under pretty dire circumstances. And I think that if you th if first think about Philly with all this work that represents the citizens who are there, so in a way it's a call for us, can we shift our perspective? And then I think if you can set up situations where people can actually see someone else, where they can begin to understand another person's perspective, when you can sort of humanize people and you can create some commonality, people can begin to shift how they see it. Now, I want to say it's not, this is not immediate. You know, when, you know, we've worked with crime victims and the men in the state prison and the victims advocates. And first people were like so resistant and everybody just argued with each other. And I'm like, oh my, this project is failing. But eventually when people started to create together, you saw how they began to turn. Could you pass the brush? Pass me the yellow. Oh, wait a minute. Is my perspective off? Just this mundane conversation that suddenly shifted into something more intimate, more personal, more profound. And it was at that moment that you could see that people were changing. Forgiveness is something a little more complex. Can that happen? But I, again, I think if the moment is right and you allow time, this has to breathe and you have to really value the authorship of everyone everywhere and pay attention. But it calls on us to see um, there has to be some mutuality. People have to see some self-benefit and they have to be able to have some resilience and hang in there knowing it's a tricky process. So it calls on both parties to be together in this, but over time we've seen people change. Thanks, Gene. Yeah, that's good. Um, Brian, uh, why do people avoid empathy and then what can be done to encourage others to embrace it? So um, I used to have a big chip on my shoulder about this question. Uh, because I lost my girlfriend in 2003 to cystic fibrosis after she'd had um, 20 surgeries and or 50 surgeries in 20 months and all I wanted to do was talk about it with every person I met and when I started talking about death and dying or the suffering I'd witnessed or the ambivalence I felt in the face of her suffering people recoiled and uh, it sent me back to the Greek plays that I had studied in college and I found solace in these plays not just because of their depictions of human suffering extreme human suffering, but also in the moral conflict that many of the characters find themselves in, helpless in the face of that suffering to do anything to change it. And so that set me uh, on this path of using Greek plays primarily to create conditions where people want to talk about it. Um, but I also feel like, um, you know, if I let everything in that happened to, I, that I could witness on a given day on the way to work or on my way home to see my daughter from work, uh, the, the homeless veteran, the person struggling with addiction, the domestic violence on the subway, uh, the abject poverty of the school to prison pipeline that surrounds us in all directions in New York City. If I let that all in, I would be so debilitated that it, would be, it wouldn't be adaptive. Uh, and yet, as a person of immense privilege, uh, it almost seems like a moral responsibility to let it in. And so I guess my short answer to the second part of the question is, um, just in advance, I think you're going to ask it, is, is that um, while I think empathy is hard to cultivate because it's, it's, 
it's very natural as a, as a species to avoid conflict, to avoid feeling what it would be appropriate to feel if we let it all in. Theater, as a medium, for all kinds of reasons, but as a technology, has the unique capacity, just like 10 minutes ago on the stage here, where every word was true, to help us to feel what it would be appropriate to feel if we would only allow it in. And I think that's the, that's the power of theater that no other medium can actually compete with or has found a way to compete with. I know that mural arts do, do an amazing job in a different way um, of doing all kinds of really exciting things. And Jane and I have actually just discovered that we'd collaborated in the past in Philadelphia. Um, there's so much reciprocity between forms, but I'm an evangelist for the felt experience of theater as a way of accessing feelings that we are constantly keeping ourselves from feeling. Thank you, Brian. Um, okay, so Mike, uh, how do you and other human rights lawyers use storytelling to inspire empathy or forgiveness? I think it's a great question, and I suppose it helps me to connect with much of what's been discussed. So, to my mind, lawyering is storytelling. Lawyering is narrative. The challenge of representing a client is to inspire empathy in the decision maker, whether it's a judge or a jury or a legislature or a member of the city council. You have to find a way to translate your client's experience and background and choices, which might be radically different from what the judge sitting on the bench has experienced and understands about the world. And the way that we try to convey our client's experience is through storytelling. And I, I mean that quite explicitly. Um, we use techniques from classical Greek drama. Um, when students, my students, start drafting their first brief, we talk about how opening their brief or standing up in court for the first time is like a curtain coming up on stage. And it's their choice who they will cast, who will step out first, what words they will say, what story they will tell. We talk about the classic elements of a steady state, a trouble, a hero, a temptation, resolution, and so forth, um, very explicitly using narrative techniques to try to find ways to help, um, uh, again, a judge who is often older, whiter, maler <laughs> than the Guatemalan asylum-seeking mom, the disabled African-American veteran, the mentally ill homeless person who seems so outside the lived experience of the judge. And yet, if we cannot help that judge to understand, to empathize with our client's situation, we will fail. Um, I think that a lot of lawyers are want to be actors who weren't good enough, <laughs> but there's of course an enormous performative aspect to lawyering. And I think theater people are drawn to law. There are so many you know, crime dramas and courtroom dramas on TV uh, because of the, uh, of the overlap in the work that we do in many ways. Uh, Jane, one question for you, and I just want to acknowledge, so somebody here asked who the audience is as we're addressing these questions. It's really broad. We discussed it before we came up on the panel. Part of it is um, it could be just for, for, not just, it can be for you and how you operate in your, in your life. You may at this very moment be struggling with empathy or forgiveness um, and in desperate need for that. And if we get to address that, that's great. It may be in the context of your work or in a way that you can help somebody else who is struggling with this. So we go in open and wherever you take it, um, this isn't, we acknowledge it's not focused, but we're trying to talk about a little bit about the how, which leads me to my question for Jane. My first question was around empathy for you. And in this case, it's, you know, what are you doing to specifically address forgiveness and reconciliation and what kind of training and help are you providing right now? Well, I'd say there are, I wanna give like a couple examples of projects to paint sort of a more accurate picture of our work. So we work with refugee new immigrant communities in Philadelphia. We take over empty storefronts and I wanna thank the foundation a lot for their support here. And we turn them into thriving community art centers. So, but we invite other people in, the longstanding neighbors, people from across the city. I think that we're really good at creating this gulf between us, divisions and dividers and boundaries and borders. We're, we're good at that, right? So, but how do we say, okay, what, what can happen that connects us? So these storefronts are vibrant and thriving and are really co-owned with the community, but they're co-owned with the city to sort of erase that divide. We did a project with a young man who provided the gun in a terrible shooting. And it, the result was this young man who ended up being a paraplegic. And the mom forgave the, the young man who provided the gun. 
So that was the beginning of her journey. But what happened is we did a major project about forgiveness. We did the project on the side of a homeless shelter. The women inside said, you know what, we're angry about something. The neighborhood said, we're angry at the city. We worked in the, at the same time we worked in the prison and did a forgiveness workshop. And the, and the people there said, you were angry at the system. And eventually there was this ripple effect and everyone everywhere across the city was talking about forgiveness. So our, our projects and our programs are all structured with an intent to really connect people, which is what I think theater does it for sure. But public art out there that's like the autobiography of the city, oh my goodness, what that does to build empathy and connection is endless. And then we have a peace wall. In this neighborhood in Philly, all communication between blacks and whites had shut down. There were some murder, there were beatings, and people said, we said, we're going to do a peace wall. And people said, you're so naive. And if someone says that to me, I'm like, <laughs> what? Okay, we're doing it. So we did it, and then that created this connection, not quickly, not overnight, but but what it did was it made people think beyond racism. They start talking about housing and the library and schools and other issues. The community leaders said the project shifted the conversation. How do we, in everything we do, every program we run, shift that conversation to think about commonality while we're lifting up diversity? Great, well, thank you. Okay, I'm actually gonna go to the Q&A because we have a lot of questions here and I'm gonna address one that was posed to me uh, uh, before the panel that was inspired at the first session um, when one of the speakers, uh, Ms. Krishnan, uh, brought up about how can we empathize with uh, a young girl who's 10 years old at a brothel being raped 40 times a day. Um, and it seems to be so far out of our, for our realm for some of us. And so I'm going to share a, a, a story and then I'm going to open up to your questions. A story that I've never shared publicly um, but I'm going to venture there. Um, I was um, out dancing late uh, many years ago, and when I left the house party, I went to f a gas station, and um, when I came out of the car, I was rushed by somebody and thrown against my car. And um, he demanded my wallet. And I think that I can be okay with words, but I'll admit in the telling of the story, this was the best I came up with. I don't have a beef with you, man. It's going to go okay. Now, I've never used that phrase, beef or whatever, for non-Americans. It means like I don't have an issue with you. And the guy responded and said, you don't have a beef with me. I'm mugging you. And I, I was like, yes, I, I, I understand. But I don't know what has happened in your life that's led you to feel so desperate that this is your only Option. What? Was his response. I'm like, well, if you don't, if you don't believe me, if you think I'm just saying this, um, go to my bumper sticker. So he's like, you're going to run, aren't you? And I'm like, no, I'm, where am I going to run? So he goes to the back and the bumper sticker says, sow the seeds of peace and justice. And he came back and he kept repeating that phrase, sow the seeds of peace and justice, sow the seeds of peace and justice. What, what does that mean to you? He asked me. And so we, we ended up having a conversation not only about what that meant to both of us, but also what led him there. And uh, ultimately, we hugged. I offered him money. He refused. And we went about our way. And um, I tell the story because I think it's, what does it reveal about how we approach things? Um, yes, I can't relate to the circumstances that he had where he felt he didn't have any money to bring food to the table or help, you know, medicine for his children and his family. But I do relate to making decisions out of fear, out of insecurity, out of guilt, out of a strong sense of responsibility, out of a perceived sense of injustice. And that part I relate to. And I wasn't doing anything tactically at all. It was simply trying to genuinely connect on a human level, and it just happened to play out that way. And I think that reveals less about me, but more about how if we approach things in the way that we engage with people and treat people with humanity, that maybe things might engage differently. And it says a lot about him in how he wa didn't take my money and walked away. And we all have judgments about people who are acting with criminal behavior, but maybe we just don't understand. So anyway, I just wanted to share that. Um, 
Okay, so let's go to some questions. One person asked, and I relate to this, but I won't venture to answer it. Um, some people here, including this person, are in work environments that inspire and require and, and invite empathy. So they may be at an NGO, for example. And they're asking, okay, I, I struggle with, I, I have to pour my heart out through, through an empathetic heart every day through my work. And then I come home or I interact with people outside of that. And I don't know if I have the well for that to, to go 24-7. So do any of you have any advice for people here who I'm sure relate to that? I can say a word about that. Um, it's something that we address explicitly in training uh, young lawyers in the United States who are going to serve traumatized clients. The experience of being next to trauma, not the person suffering the direct trauma, but being next to trauma day after day, hour after hour, um, has real and demonstrable effects on us, on, on each of us. And so uh, all of my clients have suffered significant trauma. And for the students, it's the first time often that they've represented somebody. And um, there are coping strategies and wellness strategies that we can incorporate, not as an add-on that you get to Sunday morning if you're lucky, but as part of your job, as part of the day's professional work. Uh, we, in fact, incorporate psychiatrists into our teams quite often. Um, we rep represent a lot of veterans and refugees. Both have suffered extreme trauma. And to live and listen carefully to their experiences can um, be utterly debilitating and make you not want to get out of bed. Um, but diet, exercise, socialization, and an understanding of the psychological dynamics that you are experiencing as you experience secondary trauma, I think helps. There's no magic bullet, but there are a number of strategies that one can deploy. That's right. You have to really pay attention to the people who are your teaching artists, who are delivering services. I mean, there's this storefront we have in Kensington, and, and people, everybody there is, all our teachers are nar Narcon trained, trained in CPR, and they're bringing people back to life on, on a weekly basis. So that is debilitating. You're absolutely right. So an, a more recent epiphany, I'm sorry to say more recent, is the time we take with the people who are working with us who are delivering the services. One question that was posed and a number of people gave the thumbs up, so I'll, I'll also pay attention to thumbs up if you want to participate that way too. Um, there are voices suggesting that too much empathy is bad for your health. There are admonitions of being more selfish as a health precaution. Where's the limit to caring? And, uh, you know, as you just saw, I had a story where the empathy worked out, but I'm also, as you can probably tell, empathetic to a fault. And there are times where I suffer just with somebody telling me a story. Um, but I'm still there, um, and it's really challenging, and it can affect your health. So do any of you have any, want to speak to that about the health implications and what you would encourage or discourage? I mean, look, I, I have a problem with the word empathy. I just thought I'd just interject it now that mm -hmm. we're 14 minutes left, um, which is that it's a late 19th century invention by a psychologist, psychiatrist, who invented sort of structural analysis. And um, it, in my work, it's not particularly useful to think about empathy as something tangible, as an active verb. Um, and I'm not sure one can actually have too much of it because I'm not sure anyone necessarily has it because I don't even know really what it is. But I can tell you what I think is useful and has utility, um, two things. One is proximity to human suffering. Right, so we're here on this stage, and you know, um, a few miles from here is the old airport where you know, year, not many years ago, refugee camps were you know, um, you know, in, in in large order, in proximity to this space, so proximity to suffering, and then the other thing is shared discomfort, and to me, there's much more utility in thinking about us sharing in discomfort than empathizing with each other. And to that extent, when I, um, when I talk to actors before they go on stage, the note I always give them is, make them wish they'd never come. And I say that not because I want them to re-traumatize the audience or bore them to death, or, um, but if we can push an audience to a place where everyone is scanning for the exits, well, then at least we tangibly do share something in common, no matter what our politics are. We can acknowledge the limits of our own capacity for empathy and compassion, our limits 
to actually want to be in the room in the face of human suffering. And in those limits, we can then interrogate why it actually is so hard to be in that space. And for me, that's where the real utility lies, not in talking about helping people to empathize, but in actually getting them to stay in the room and confront some of the most uncomfortable truths, not as individuals, but as a community. But, but like I, okay, so I see what you're saying about empathy, but I all, but I feel maybe it's the, so very, I'm very like practical. Like I think that mural arts is sort of practical. So yeah. you sit with that discomfort and then what? Like we were just talking about that, what you did in Philadelphia and yeah. somebody in the back said they needed services and boom, there was a commissioner there, a mental health yeah. person got services. Like it's well, that's not, what's so exciting about your work, Jane. I mean, uh, why I'm so impressed by what you do is, um, Empathy, or whatever it is we're talking about, is an opening. Mm -hmm. Right. And the question, the real question, I think, of the hour is what happens when people are open? What new things are possible exactly. that weren't possible before? We started right. with the military as our primary client, and we got hired by the Department of Defense, which is, I know is not uncontroversial, and we did hundreds of performances all over the world of ancient Greek war plays simply to open the door, because at the time it was seen as a career-ending gesture to raise your hand and say, I'm struggling with an invisible wound. And, but the other responsibility is putting those resources in front of the people exactly. so they can walk toward it. So the idea that someone could be opened by an artistic experience, and then they walk through the door toward the resources that you provide. Right. That's the most exciting work, I think. To yeah, be it makes me want to so. jump up and down. Yeah, Thank you. Too. I really appreciate it. <laughs> uh, and I'll just add to this, and then I have a question for Mike. Um, as it relates to the health, if you, I'll, I'll refer you to two researchers who have looked directly at this. And so while the questioner actually says it, empathy, they assume, would be bad for your health for reasons you can understand, it actually turns out that it's actually good for your health, as is forgiveness. Um, and so if you look at the research of a woman named Sarah Conrath at the uh, University of Indiana at the Lilly School of Philanthropy, and if you look at the research by Everett Worthington, who's at the Virginia Commonwealth University, who's done massive numbers of studies on the health benefits and impacts of forgiveness, you'll see that it's actually good for your health and you can learn more about it and maybe be inspired. Um, uh, Mike, there are a couple of questions um, that have come from the audience about forgiveness in the face of injustice, in the context of criminality. Um, and do you have any thoughts of that about how people, there are a couple of people here who are grappling with um, injustice happening and the person doesn't go to jail, they said, and or they can still commit a crime. Uh, how, how do you approach forgiveness and have you seen that? Some of the most exciting developments in the law across nations, not only in the United States in recent years, I think has been a sense of uh, restorative justice, a, a justice that redeems and forgives. And it arises particularly in criminal justice settings where the victim and the defendant uh, may have continuing relationships um, of one kind or another. Um, I am primarily a civil lawyer, not a criminal lawyer. Um, and I have to admit, when I saw forgiveness on the panel, I'm kind of a hard-nosed litigator. I, I like to sue the bastards. Um, and in the United States right now, there are a lot of bastards. It's a target-rich <laughs> environment. Um, and rarely at the end of a civil rights case, even if you have achieved some measure of justice, hopefully for your clients, and perhaps protected them from some measure of injustice, the other side rarely says, ah, you're right, I'm sorry. Um, if anything, the formalities of law teach them to say, we do not admit liability, but we will stop doing the illegal thing now, and, uh, and avoids notions of forgiveness. And certainly the lawyers for the, um, the bad guys are telling their clients, don't say you're sorry, that would be terrible. So law as a discipline does not, um, do especially well with forgiveness historically. That's partly why the restorative justice movement is so powerful and so exciting on the criminal justice side. Um, uh, and I hope that it will find its way into the civil side of the law as well. It seems like a great injustice of our current legal system that at the very moment when people should be allowed to grieve and express their emotion, the, the judge is banging the gavel and saying order in the court and no expression can be expressed on either side. The people on, on the plaintiff side or the defendant aren't allowed to actually come together in some way. And in Aeschylus's Oresteia, which takes place on the rock, the Areopagus Hill over here next to the Acropolis, the very opposite happened in the birth of the murder trial where the Furies were allowed to vent their anger after having been slighted by Athena and by the justice system that was just being set up. And I don't know where we lost our way but I know that DAs and 
uh, defense attorneys become de facto mental health counselors for grieving people who feel that they've been slighted with, by the justice system, and there's no place for that, and there's no training for that, and it strikes me as a really hard position to right. be and of, and of course, in the, in the setting you just gave us, the judge on the bench, the defendant on one side with the lawyer, the prosecutor on the other side, there's other people in that room, too. Inevitably, there's family of the victim and family of the defendant, each of whom has lost something. They're the ones filling the courtroom, and their lives and relationships and community are going to go forward, regardless of what the judge says you know, in the paper and regardless of what happens to the individual, because we are not all alone. We are all bound up with each other. Um, there are broader community effects when that separation is forced by the law. I think that's what's so beautiful about restorative justice because so many people, people get sentenced actually to us. There are a lot of young men and women who've been in and out of the criminal justice system and they're really angry and feel they've been wronged and the community feels they've been wronged. And so an antidote for this is to, to create beauty. Um, it's not like a panacea for everything that, that impacts the city, but it shows us the catalytic powerful role that art can play in dealing with that. And I think that theme of restorative justice is so soothing in some way. It's meditative. It's healing. So another question from a few people in some form is that, to this questioner, is empathy actually more an egotistical thing, where it's a need to help others and or be needed? And that the questioner was saying that basically, um, I may be more likely, and we're saying me, but like, that I may be more likely to be there for Brian, person to person, and to um, help and then feel like I was helpful, yay, yay, me. And, but I'm less likely to help the young girl in the brothel, and this questioner was talking about that we do less to help truly pe other people in need outside of our circle. So can any of you speak to that? There's absolutely no question that we, you know, until it happens to someone we know or someone we love, it's hard for us to imagine what that person may be going through. And I, on one hand, I hold us, we, we have to be accountable to that. On the other hand, it, is, it's, it, it requires imagination to, to enter into that space. And I think less than condemning people for their limitations and their ability to imagine what the nine-month-old year, year nine old baby, I mean, that's what was referenced earlier, right? Nine-month-old baby. That's so inconceivable to me, so beyond my comprehension, so horrible, that immediately every part of me shuts down when I hear that. Um, but I've also, I think, we have become inured to the suffering we consume through the media through which we consume it. And, um, you know, it is, you know, we, we have to find new and novel ways to jar ourselves into the place where we actually use our imaginations to go beyond our families, the people we love, to people we don't know. And it is an act, it's a failure of imagination. Um, I'm not sure it's a failure of empathy because I don't know what empathy is, but I, I do know what imagination is. And it strikes me that we need more imagination uh, if we're gonna reach the place where we're actually gonna be wakened to action when we, heard, when we hear the words nine-year-old baby sexually assaulted. I think that's the power of your work, though, because it becomes not abstract. There's something that becomes real. And I think if it's not in your, your life, your immediate, it's your immediate family, surroundings, it does seem like it's distant. And I think, I have to say, I do think that that is the power of art to sort of bring it sort of in people's realm. Now, it doesn't happen all the time, but enough, I think. Um, yeah. For better or worse, we need mediation. I mean, I really think that's what it is. The yes. judge needs the mediation for all kinds of messed up reasons. And, but we, just normal people, need mediation to enter into the space where we can imagine the other person's perspective. And all these forms of art originally and in their origins were born out of, I would argue, necessity. Mm -hmm. um, um, as was law, of course. Yes. Before law, uh, if there was a local dispute, you'd beat each other up with clubs, and law became the way to displace violent dispute resolution with hopefully nonviolent dispute resolution. And um, uh, I wanted to say, though, that I, I'm not sure that I was hearing it correctly, but I thought I might have heard in the question um, that you shared was a, um, was a bit more of a challenge, that are you, are you saying empathy because it sounds better, but it's really some sort of savior complex, some kind of rescue complex that is... Uh, preserving and even entrenching power and privilege rather than some sort of altruistic impulse. I, I'm not sure that was the intent of the question, but I might have heard a little bit of it in there. And if so, I was going to say something in response to that. Go ahead. Which is, um, 
that I think there's an enormous risk of that. Um, and I think that any time, uh, we haven't talked as much about the responsibility of telling stories. We've talked about how you tell stories and what its effect might be on audiences and, and others that you're trying to persuade or, or connect to. But as lawyers, uh, I, we certainly have an intense obligation to fairly tell the story that we're, which, if we can even understand it. We have a responsibility to listen and to try to understand before we can begin to translate. So last question, and it's a really easy one in the last minute and a half, it's not. Um, but how can we truly empathize with people who are different from us? This came up in other panels, this comes up just in the way that we live, and we watch our world become more and more divided. Um, so if empathy can get us there, how do we learn to empathize with those who are different from us? My 20 seconds, and we have 20 seconds, I think. Uh, there's no shortcut, there's no substitute. In my sense, you have to sit down and talk to somebody face to face. And from that communication can come a beginning of a glimmer of mutual understanding. Points of connection, points of contact, points of confusion, all of that will emerge. We lawyer across difference, as we say it in the law. We lawyer across difference of age and race and class and gender and, and ability and language. But if we can't make the effort to try to understand each other, we're certainly lost. I, there's this quote that says that we need to um, muster the ability to transcend the physical and emotional confines of self to contemplate something different. I think we have to ask ourselves, what kind of world do we want? And I know it's risky and sometimes we fail and sometimes it's too much empathy and it could be self-aggrandizement. I don't know what it is, but I know that the world is a mess and too divided and we need to counter that dominant narrative. I think we need humility and I think we need to enter into a place of this moral distress and acknowledge that the blood is already on our hands and of all the issues we're trying to address and we're complicit in systems of power that cause this suffering. So one of the most inspiring results of one of our performances early on was a veteran sharing his own moral distress at having killed civilians in the Iraq war met by a woman in the audience in Oregon who admitted malpractice to that a veteran by saying she'd refused to treat veterans who'd come to her practice complaining of symptoms that could have only been war-related PTSD for fear that she would be helping aid the war effort. All the veterans came up to me afterwards and said that was so much better than thank you for your service or some false sense of empathy that we need to get down in the muck and acknowledge that uh, we are we are covered in responsibility for the suffering that we're trying to address and I think that counteracts some of the sort of savior complexes that sometimes enter into this field. Okay, with that we'll respectfully end and we um, please join me in thanking them and we hope this has been helpful to you in some way. Well, uh, I'll get started uh, before the time starts ticking down so we can have a few more minutes. Uh, thank, you. thank you all very much for staying on. Uh, at, the, at the background of what we have been discussing, uh, we have been discussing uh, today morning and today afternoon, uh, inevitably lies the elephant in the closet, which is the moral values and ethics that inform 
or fail to inform all of the uh, activities, actions and circumstances and dilemmas that very elaborately um, our predecessors here in, in these panels uh, touched upon. So the title of, of this particular panel is Morality versus Ethics. And you know, when we talk about morality and ethics, we can mean many things. And technically, one can really dive into the very exact definitions of each one of them. But more or less, when one speaks about morality, for the purposes of this panel, we'll, we'll refer to values that are descriptive in nature. And when we refer to ethics, we will refer to values that have a normative sense. Uh, in this sense, in the descriptive sense, uh, uh, morality is put forward by society and it is held dear by individuals in terms of their very uh, private beliefs. In the normative sense, uh, in that of ethics, uh, you know, rational persons uh, recognize and adhere to rules and values that are universally applicable and objectively valuable. Uh, so in this sense, Claire, I would like to start with you and ask you, you know, you know, you're a trained philosopher. Uh, for the last 3,000 years, you know, philosophy has been trying to answer the question of whether values are contextual or universal. Are we any closer to getting an answer to that? No. <laughs> it's not very reassuring. <laughs> so the first thing, just to um, uh, show the, the problem, I, my, my favorite line um, when I talk to my students about philosophy is, Philosophers are great at diagnosing problems. We're terrible at offering cures for the problems that we've just diagnosed. So even if you just take um, the distinction that you just made, right, the title of the panel, ethics and, ethics and morality or ethics and morals, and depending on, we can all say that, um, or most people would say there's a distinction even if they couldn't agree on what that distinction is or couldn't agree on what ethics are or in those subcategories. But I actually just read a few days ago um, an article in The Conversation about this topic, and it completely reversed how they defined ethics and morality. So in general, they come from a similar root. Um, morality is the, the Latin version of, of ethics. Um, and the view has changed, and the view tended to be ethics is that which is external, um, professional ethics, for example. and. Um, Morality is that which is internal or comes from smaller groups, families, um, religion, etc. And the conversation reversed that completely and said, no, morality is that which is external, part of a general group, and ethics is that which is personal and individual. And so even there, we can't even agree on um, how we're even going to understand the terms broadly. But if you go through the history of philosophy, and I'm not going to, don't, um, don't get scared, I'm not going to give you a, a history of philosophy. Um, but even if you start with someone like Aristotle, who thought that the practically wise person can benefit from having other friends who are also practically wise, and you might say, well, what would be the need for that if they're already practically wise? He thought that um, you expand your vision of um, how you might make ethical decisions. And so Aristotle was actually very clear. People, I think, misinterpret him, the golden mean of everything in moderation, but that isn't what he meant. It was the right emotion at the right time for the right reason, um, given the particular circumstance. So someone would show rage, um, given the letter that was, um, that was read in the previous panel on democracy in the theater, if their son or their child was killed, and it would be completely appropriate to show rage in that particular circumstance. In a different circumstance, maybe not. Um, if you look at someone like Kant, who had um, a categorical, you know, this idea of the categorical imperative, and everyone is supposed to follow this. And then given that people have a problem with universality, you can see Kant's commentators, 21st century, 20th century, making it very um, specific to circumstances. So I think people, they want something universal. They want to believe there's something universal at the same time that that worries them because context matters. So no, we're not any closer to the philosophers agreeing on whether there's this thing called universality or whether things are contextually driven. Sorry. And, and, <laughs> and, and, and do you think that lack of agreement has to do with the fact that it is just too difficult to reach that one overarching value or set of overarching universal values that are out there and we need to perceive? Or is it just a lack of to the tools that we use 
to reach those values, whether it's a social network, mm -hmm. friends, lack of empathy, or mm -hmm. something else? That's a good question. So this is what I think. I don't know if this is, if this is right. Um, I think that in the age of enlightenment, and you know, theoretically, I mean, we're in, we're in sort of post-modernity, so all these things are being questioned. I'm still an enlightenment thinker. Um, I, I think people want to believe that there is a truth. And when I think about my own philosophy classes, I think my students are struggling with trying to figure that out. You know, are we in here together trying to solve a problem and get to the answer? Or are we here to try to get closer to a right way to act or a right way to think about something? Um, I think that there are some moral problems and some political problems that no matter how much you reason, you're not going to get to that one single truth. I, I just don't think that. I think that there are others where if um, people communicate with each other and we listen to each other, we might be better able to understand where the disagreement comes from and try to ameliorate some of that. But I think there's always going to be some space where those problems are not resolved. We have to live with that ambiguity or live with that disagreement. Uh, Which is not relativism, I want to be clear. <laughs> what, what is that? What is relativism? No, no, it is no. not relativism, but what is it? I was about to ask Kefi something, but you just... Oh, no, no, you can do No, but this is, a great, this is a great distinction that you made. So what you, what you just described is not relativism. Right. What would you call it, that difference of opinion? So we, we have discussed, um, so something like, I go back to Aristotle, and I'd say, um, I don't think Aristotle also thinks it's relativism in the sense of, I think killing is okay and you think killing is not okay, or I think murder is okay and you think it's not okay. Um, murder is a legal term, so I want to stay away from that specifically. I, I think that given the idea of um, some kind of pluralism we talked about with Isaiah Berlin, so um, I might value freedom above all else and you might value something else, and these are values I can understand, or they are values that you can understand, and you could understand even if you disagree why I might privilege one over the other. I think with relativism, you, so I actually just have a problem with relativism because I, I, I know people say that they're relativists, but when you push them hard enough, they're not. It's just that they don't, they don't want someone telling them what to do, but they're perfectly happy to do that to somebody else. And so I think that ultimately, um, when I think about things like cultural relativism, for example, there's always a subgroup that that action is being done to who would be perfectly happy to say, I think this is wrong. We always look at the dominant group to determine a kind of cultural relativism. So I just have a problem with how that term circulates. Um, so when I think about um, this, the question of how do we think about, how do we think about differing views, some of it has to do with intractable um, principles that we, we all share. We don't want to give one of them up. And some people in the group are going to privilege one or prioritize one over the other. And that's when I think moral decisions become complicated and, and a difficulty arises in trying to resolve them in a way that the whole group can agree. Effie, you work on the subject of bioethics. So these dilemmas are more than just dilemmas on paper or dilemmas that happen in academic circles. They are real dilemmas that they often inform legislation and they often inform our views about what it is to take a life away and what it is to, uh, to not take a life away. How does this discussion reflect on your line of work? So we have, we have um, a very similar discussion, we just have it on specific cases, as you say. And I don't think it's any easier uh, because, again, it is the core problem we're addressing. So um, there are many cases in, in bioethics we struggle with that. Do we have um, universal principles for how we conduct research, for example, biomedical research? Uh, or in the case of um, a good example I always find is assisted reproductive technologies. We struggled for years determining a number of those things. And what you see in the outcome is that for many years these things were regulated differently from country to country because the conclusion in this country from that debate ended up being different. Now the question is, I think, does this mean that we don't have a universally accepted principle or does it mean that despite agreement 
at core, each country had to make different determinations depending on context, depending on political circumstances, depending on a number of other things. And I think there is something else that we, we could take into account. Um, if I just uh, uh, divert a little bit from the bioethics to say that we might, um, in the question of whether we have something which is universally acceptable and the tools to, to address it, if you don't mind, I will sprinkle in some empirical data that just came out recently, and I was fascinated by that. Um, research that came out of Oxford, anthropology research, looking at 60 different cultures um, and investigating the question of whether we have some common morality. And the interesting fact is that in 60 very diverse cultures, it seemed that we do have some very basic things we find across all cultures like a notion of fairness that we want. We all seem to think that fairness is important to all of us. That's interesting, right? Or that we, um, real, we have to take care of our, of our family. Or um, that we should not um, uh, take away somebody's property. That's interesting. You can translate those back, those rules, as they called in the research, to some of the principles. And I think to me, it was quite, I was quite optimistic when I said, okay, all of these diverse cultures, you know, put the layer of the culture, we do seem to have the same moral sensibility on a very small list of things. So I think what happens is, yes, we have that, but how we act upon those in the different contexts, and that's we see in bioethics very frequently, is it can differ from you know, one circumstance to the other. And perhaps another thing that we're seeing in bioethics also, maybe in other areas, we can look at the same question over time, and we can see that our determinations and our debate changes over time. Again, if I take the example of assisted reproductive technologies in vitro fertilization, when it came around, a lot of people had a lot of disagreement, a lot of uh, distress about this. Um, one of the Nobel laureates, um, Jim Watson, who you know, discovered the um, double helix, co, co um, uh, uh, discovered, he is quoted in an interview saying that if we allow artificial, art, artificial reproduction, assisted reproduction, all hell will break loose. But it's a big statement. He was referring to moral uh, issues that can come out. Look at today, right? Today, we are pretty much with some pockets, <laughs> some religious pockets maybe, and the population, we're very okay with that. So there has been a way in which we debated through those issues. Some of the mor moral disagreements have been resolved because some things changed also, or what we factor into those discussions. So I think to cut it, to make it shorter, is that yes, we have this challenge. In bioethics, we see that, that struggle, but we have to look at this intercultur interculturally as having some core, and also I find it very interesting to look at this over time and the change that come in there. Well, very interestingly, you mentioned how um, uh, people tend to agree on some very basic principles. Uh, and at, at the end uh, of your elaboration, you mentioned how crucial it is to see these things over time. How confident can one be that uh, the convergence towards a certain set of beliefs nowadays is the result of a genuine uh, accumulation of objective moral knowledge rather than a snapshot in the, you know, of history where we will look back on it and uh, see these things the way that we see witch hunt in the medieval ages? Well, I'm not incredibly confident that, you know, we're, we're, we will always uh, move to the right direction. If I look overall, if we look at our progress overall, let's say our, you know, moral progress, that I'm a little bit more optimistic about that. I think we've made good progress over time. Um, but to the specific questions we're looking at in my, in my field, I think it will depend a lot on the tools we use, but also in the ways in which we engage and deliberate about them. Uh, very often, I think, in, in kind of figuring out where is our core problem and whether it can be resolved in any way is in listening to a diversity of views about that. How different actors, different agents experience those, what kind of principles they bring forward and how they feel that, that they might be affected. And, and there I have to say, um, it's something, we, the how we're doing this, it's still something we're working on. Um, at least in the specific areas that I'm on, let's say public engagement, right? Get a diversity of opinion, things of that sort. 
we have some good examples, but all in all, we don't have a, a perfect example of how we reason about this and deliberate with each other. Can I, can I ask a question? I know it's what probably supposed to answer questions, but, I, but when I think about the, the question that you just raised about the, snap, the snapshot in time, it's hard not to think about how we talk about things like relativism because we look back at particular times when people were treated in a variety of different ways, but we forget that in many of those instances, conversations were happening at that time. We assume, for example, that, I mean, I, mean, I realize that I'm not gonna make this presumption you know, here, but that people are thinking this here, but in general, we assume, for example, when we had slavery, that that was, that, was the, um, that was the view of the day. That wasn't the view of the day, that was the people who, who had power. But abolition couldn't have happened without people who at the time disagreed with it. Same with the women's movement. We have women's movement that happened in the 50s, in the 40s, in the 30s, in the 19th century. In the 18th century, you can go back to Plato in the Republic and the question is being raised. And so what I find always interesting about these questions about the issue of moral progress it's, it's, one has to ask, is it a change in behavior or a change in thought? Because I think those things are not always related. Thinking about the, the, the panel very early today about, um, you know, what should we do? You know, and in many cases, it's not that people aren't even, you know, too busy to think about something. Sometimes it's they don't have the, they know the right thing. They don't necessarily have the courage to act on it. And I think that those distinctions need to be made when we think about, um, what is it that people disagree about? And sometimes it's not a disagreement. Sometimes people know the right thing to do, but they can't be brought forward to do it. And I think that's the case with many moral issues or political issues over the course of time. That it's, it's not that people weren't thinking about it or didn't know what, what was right or wrong. Or, or maybe they're not all of them thinking about it. Yes, so there are not all of them thinking about it. A few people, True. and yeah. those maybe the ones who didn't have the opportunity right. to act that. And if I may just add one little thing here is that Sometimes we, we, and I will say who is we, but we might operate under an assumption, we perceive something as such. In my area, for example, now, people say, well, um, you know, China, China is a, now a new a superpower in scientific research. People will come and say, oh, the Chinese do that because, you know, they don't care about privacy. Now, who, who again, it's a perception we may have in the West about the Chinese people not care about privacy. Then you go and talk to the people and you must say, wait, I mean, a lot of people there, they just cannot express their opinion, they cannot act, but they actually do care very much. Had they had the opportunity to act on it, they would have looked very different. So the perception issue, I think, is also something in our discourse that, that matters. I, I, think, I think this exchange was extremely useful, uh, not least for two reasons. Uh, once because we have like a resident expert on, on, on China here on the panel. And the second reason is because uh, it, it, it seems that, among other things, uh, China seems to be a, a, a force of nature in the last few years in all sorts of research undertaking, including uh, research in the biological sciences. So, Susan, I mean, this was a, a theoretical discussion about ethics and how ethics can be particular or universal, but you really are at the forefront of actual research uh, in, in, you know, in, in, in biology, in, in, stem, in, in stem cells. How does this discussion and the pos possible difference of opinion uh, on ethics or, uh, and morality uh, between China and the rest of the world affect your job, if, if at all? So I think um, first, in terms of a universal morality or really a universal value set, um, I, think, I think we could all agree that um, human health is, is a priority for individuals. And I make that point. Uh, I think that um, we've been dealing in an unusual circumstance with stem cell research since uh, the late 90s um, when human cells were first isolated and actually before that uh, because, because of the varying um, uh, political allergies to uh, different forms of stem cell research, um, the entire international community basically had to make up its own rules and, um, and we did that really well through um, IRBs and escrow committees and so forth. So this is a, a kind of giant experiment in self-regulation. And actually in the US, when the NIH jumped back in, um, they, uh, after uh, Obama um, overturned an executive order, really not that much changed. But, um, 
the people who uh, um, uh, the uh, uh, NIH turned to were those of us who were in the leadership of the uh, kind of self-created governing body to figure this out. I think, I like IVF as, a, um, uh, as an example, but I think it was partly discussion, but partly because when everybody saw baby Louise Brown, this cute little baby, and they realized, oh my God, I've been trying to have kids, I can't have kids, here's this amazing baby. Um, I think it was, it was the fact that there was a solution to a big problem, which is infertility. And I think that's really what changed people's minds. And all of a sudden, a little baby's not scary. Um, and so it, it, that's an oversimplification. It took a number of years. But in the US, um, we have, um, in our lab, we created uh, uh, something that avoids mitochondrial uh, disease. It removes a terrible neurological, uh, uh, tragic, fatal disease from an entire uh, family. Um, we have not been able to, and that was completely ignored uh, from a regulatory perspective because in the U.S., other than regulating eggs, um, human eggs, we don't regulate IVF, which is interesting. In the U.K., everything is regulated, but most things are permitted. It's, it's really kind of wild. So in the U.K., they've gone forward with this technique that we developed uh, in the U.S. Uh, in our lab with collaborators. Um, in the U.S., we are not able to do that because the theoretical discussions have really held uh, sway. And so people are, are contemplating, well, what happens if we do an egg swap with you know, a 70-year-old woman who wants to have twins? I mean, my god, I think that's a different discussion. But um, it, it is the reality of the patient who sees a potential solution and someone who is looking at things without a personal emotional connection. Politically, we've seen people flip when a family member is sick. I mean, you know, on the, uh, on the right side of the aisle, uh, some of the leading uh, senators who were in favor of uh, embryonic stem cell research before we could do this new technique with skin and blood, which everything we learned about doing that came from these leftover uh, embryos from IVF, hundreds of thousands are in the United States, millions worldwide, sitting in tanks of liquid nitrogen in various stages of preservation or more likely decay, and parents are then being asked after they either have completed their families or if they haven't been successful, um, what do we do with these embryos? As opposed to, in, in the UK actually, it was a wonderful decision about you're either going to make a decision uh, when you complete your IVF to allow them to be used for research, to help someone else, thrown out as medical waste, or adopted by someone so that they could have children. Almost no one chose that option. People really weren't comfortable uh, throwing out the embryos. Um, they were really comfortable. Uh, saying, okay, we've either been successful or not, but now we can help research. So I think it's the outcome that changes things. And in China, which is relevant, um, the, it, it's not as transparent, so I can only speak to what the Chinese government has said, which is they've placed the um, kind of rogue scientist who did the gene editing, maybe not so rogue, um, who did the gene editing of the babies for no reason, actually, because you can avoid HIV transmission without doing that technique. But they've allegedly placed that individual under house arrest. I don't know. Has that happened? Has it not happened? But there are, as long as there's money to be made and people are desperate and we don't have good solutions, there are going to be bad actors who are happy to take their money and do crazy things. So it seems that you would you would probably agree with Effie about the very basic uh, level or type of values that are important to human beings, like uh, the right to uh, having the opportunity to, 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 to help your loved ones in good health or, or things like that, and everything else comes, com comes as secondary to that. Would you say that this is something that you would agree with? And then, 
if you do my next question would be in terms of the difference in the approach to research ethics between different places around the world, would you say that things need to be accelerated a little bit in some parts of the world or things need to be held back in, in other parts of the world? Well, it's interesting because, um, uh, so first, I, I do, um, I will always come out personally, my values, um, in favor of uh, relieving suffering. That's just me, it's my, uh, my cultural background, uh, and it's my belief system. Um, I think you, uh, I'm not dealing with questions that you probably are dealing with of uh, a donor sibling. Um, so, since I don't deal with them, I'm gonna just note <laughs> it and, and move on. Um, but I do think that uh, we will see with, you know, gene editing, um, there now is, uh, you know, on the one side, a call uh, from an international, uh, internationally recognized group of scientists for an absolute moratorium, uh, including one of the inventors is one of our investigators. Absolutely, that's it. No gene editing, we've got to really think about this. Then, there's another group, co-inventors, very uh, important people involved, several of whom are here, um, who feel, no, a moratorium is not the way to go because when you put a ban on something, the science moves ahead, but it goes into the darkness, even more so than you have now with stem cell tourism and crazy business and bad actors. So I think, it's, I think these discussions are really critical, but people are scared because they don't know what's gonna happen. When they see that you know, their neighbor was dying of congestive heart failure and now is okay, or uh, you know, their loved one uh, or their child had a form of cancer or, or blindness that was, was then cured. I think it makes it easier for people. I don't think people, people do well and governments do well with the abstract. One of the questions we got from the audience, and Robbie, I'm, I'm, I'm about to ask you about how uh, ethics in practice gets informed because this is where the discussion is going. One of the questions from the audience is, uh, it, it may be relevant to what uh, we just said, but I'll, I'll read it. First, we solve infertility, then we cure genetic diseases before birth, then we choose eye color, height, and hair color. Where should we stop? What is okay to adjust with eugenics and what is not? Effie, would you care to address this? That's a very big question. <laughs> and it's a very good question, and it's the question we are actually struggling with as well. As you progress, at in science um, and in what we can do, then we pose that question, if we can't do, should we do it? And under what conditions? I think what, what uh, Susan was talking about is if the purpose typically is to alleviate suffering, I think there we tend to have more agreement as to yes, we can do it, we should do it. Um, then we come into a, a, a domain that um, what we call enhancement, for example, right? Uh, where I think we still have, we have disagreement as to whether that's a direction we should be going. And the disagreement comes in, in various formats. It's not only whether is that per se the right thing to be doing, it's also how it's going to affect others, how it's going to be distributed, that sort of thing. Do we privilege some populations or some traits? What kind of um, society this sort of thing will, will create? What kind of resource allocation is going to lead? So there's a number of considerations that come into over and above uh, alleviating, alleviating suffering. But I think it's, it's the question we keep having in the back of our minds, even when we discuss where is the next step. Think back before we go to gene, um, genetic engineering when we discussed pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, right? And we did this many years ago. We can look at the, we can biopsy the, the embryo and we can see certain things that we don't want to have and then we don't implant the sick embryo or the embryo that will become sick. That was very debatable. I live in a country where we tend to regulate a lot. That's Switzerland. I think my Swiss colleagues in the audience know that. Um, so we... In Switzerland, we regulated, we did not allow pre-implantation genetic diagnostics for many, many years because we thought, okay, well, no, we, all of us, but a lot of people thought that's not the right thing to do because it does bring us down to making these sorts of selections. Um, once eventually the debate moved on, people started putting it on the table and the discussion then, what, what is the short list of things we can allow 
these biopsies at the embryo. And that was a very difficult discussion, again, because we're thinking slippery slope. Maybe then we start doing other things that we're not sure we should be doing. Finally, and that's to your point about changing over time, in 2000 for, uh, 2014, the law changed, and now PGD, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, is allowed, became the thing we all agreed upon to do. So it has, that's, you, you are smiling to that one. Well, I think that, the the slippery slope, and the slippery slope has kept, um, you know, mitochondrial replacement therapy out uh, of uh, being available, except, um, you know, in kind of very limited circumstances. It's a horrible disease. Um, Pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, uh, when used for something like Tay-Sachs, uh, which, you know, the, the babies die a horrible death, um, you know, they're, they're born with a life sentence, and maybe they last, you know, three or four years. I think if we stick to, and people don't like to do that, but in fact our ability to, um, to enhance and understand the implications, even physically, of what we're enhancing is really limited. So when we talk about gene editing or pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, even PGD is not perfect because there's mosaicism. There's a much higher degree of mosaicism than people understood. So it's not a guarantee that you're gonna get it right, so that's one. And with gene editing, for example, I think there's a huge difference between getting rid of sickle cell anemia in somebody who's suffering and, you know, some wacky alleged enhancement. The slippery, slip, slippery slope, it's not, I just gave it a name. It's not that I advocated for <laughs> no, it. No, <laughs> no, I know, but that's the argument always. Yeah, is, it is. You know, yeah. and, and we have to think about it, but, but I think we have to think about it in, you know, if we decided we're going to enhance everybody and make everybody fabulous, I, I don't I, think we have the knowledge to actually do so that. It's very, kind of a quick one because it's also relevant to Greece. I mean, in Greece, we used to have a, a huge problem of thalassemia. Yeah. It's a population, you know, that this was common. What happened many years ago, people were advised and forced almost to do carrier screening, okay. and then they were told not to get married or not to have children. Now, that's interesting because what happened over time is that we have a lot less, if any, thalassemia. There are similar programs in Cyprus, in, in other parts of the Mediterranean. And, and what we did, not with high tech, right? We did it with screening and, and a sort of a measure of, of policy was to try to eliminate it from the population. People, we all think that is a public health success. When we talk about successes and, and screening, uh, that's one of the ones we, qu we quote very frequently, which is interesting to see in the discussion of where, where we stop or, or how we make the determinations of what is okay to do. No, but I think that, and that is a big success, and that's uh, also uh, being done in uh, uh, a number of Orthodox Jewish communities with uh, diseases like uh, Tay-Sachs, but it isn't only people in those communities who have those diseases, and so, you know, out of a non-orthodox, uh, not even, you know, 100% uh, from a, you know, from a, a Jewish parent and a, uh, you know, a, and a Russian Orthodox, uh, uh, you know, parent, you could have those same diseases. So, it's great, but we still have to have solutions for, for other people. But I think, I mean, I think that's great. But the core, right, the, we yeah. agreed on the, so how to solve the problem, that's what I was trying yeah. to And early enough. I think, I think this is, this is very, very interesting and it touches on quite a few things of, on public policy and it, it certainly touches on, on, on the question of uh, if legislation moves on, does it always reflect uh, a new discovery in the realm of ethics? I mean, we've seen uh, abortion legislation being rolled back repeatedly and whether that's right or, or wrong, it, it, it really does touch on the issue on how um, uh, morality is reflected or not in, in, in legislation. And o on that bombshell, so to speak, I think Robbie's expertise comes into play because Robbie has looked at, at state actors and how they use ethics and morality in order to uh, make a case about things that might not necessarily take into account the reflections that we have been taking on. And it's a different type of point of view. Yes, um, may I step forward? Absolutely. <clears throat> I'm coming forward because I'm going to show you uh, a video um, to illustrate what possibly happens when the ethics that my colleagues are talking about is scaled up to the level of a state project. When we look at ethics as an issue of the state, an action of the state, 
or it could be a society or another political group. You mentioned some of these issues. We see something very different. Really, the ethic itself disappears. It is replaced by something uh, that is much larger than the ethic, which is the production process of producing the ethical outcome, which in the case of a state is producing an ethical citizen. And the d we need to pay attention to what is meant by an ethical system and who is chosen by the state to be an ethical system. And especially we need to pay attention to the way in which those ethics are delivered to these target people who are going to be made, made into citizens. Uh, and I'm going to illustrate this in a minute, but I want to suggest a couple of things we should bear in mind when we think about this. The e ethics delivery by a state really depends on versions like the Western liberal idea of competitive discourse. We persuade a person to believe in certain ideas, or in authoritarian states, uh, in certain cases, we force them to. This is not actually a result of values. It's a result of the concept of the mind. Whether you think that the mind is, uh, has a thinking agent behind it that needs to be persuaded, or whether you think that the mind is a machine in which you, the state, can replace the parts. That's the first point I'd like to make. The second point is that actually what happens when a state takes up an ethical project is that the ethics doesn't matter. What matters is the sentiment that is conveyed and communicated together with the ethic. I'll give you a single example. In China, we all know about the Cultural Revolution. The ethic behind the Cultural Revolution is one that perhaps many of us would recognize. It's in the category that Claire described as the understandable basic value of class fairness or equality. But the sentiment with which it was conveyed, that what people gathered from the communication of this state-level ethic was one of hatred, essentially. Love for the party, hatred for the class enemies. The reality of cultural revolution was not that class enemies were wiped out, removed. It was that they were tortured and brutalized for days, weeks, months, years on end. A million people or something committed suicide. So this is about sentiment. It's not actually about the ethic. And these two things are inseparable. Now, I'm going to show in a minute a little video that just came out last week. Uh, the BBC took a video in Xinjiang. Xinjiang is the northwest quarter of China. It's about 12 times the size of Greece, has a population of 20 million. Half of them are Turkic Muslims who are not ethnic Chinese. Uh, one million of these Turkic Muslims we have just discovered two years ago because of the work of a Cambridge PhD student in Tibetan studies in, in my field, uh, by chance, more or less, discovered that about a hundred camps have been set up that were invisible, unmarked, marked as vocational training centers in which we think a million Turkic Muslims, mainly Uyghurs and Kazakhs, are held for an indefinite amount of time for no known crime and without any legal basis. Uh, this, uh, what we're going to see, is the first time a foreign TV crew was allowed by the Chinese government into one of these, quotes, vocational training center. When you watch it, I want you to think, if we didn't have my introduction and the commentary of, of the BBC journalist, would we know that there was anything odd about the ethical education that we see in the video? Let's watch the video. Then they switch from Uyghur, their mother tongue, to Chinese lyrics, written by President Xi Jinping. They've been convicted of no crime, faced no trial, but we're told 
China now believes it can determine their guilt in advance. Some people, he didn't kill them when he was there, but he has already shown a character. Very likely, this person will be killed in a few weeks. So, are we waiting for him to be arrested? Or are we going to wait for him to be arrested? 犯罪，呃，活动之前，呃，就制止他。So we can see here immediately that is an ethical process of education. We can see that that's very、uh, remarkable because twenty years ago, maybe even five years ago, when you were educated in a prison in China, you were given political education. You were told you must learn that the Communist Party is best and that Xinjiang is part of China, and so on. Now they're being taught ethics. This is part of Xi Jinping's. Twelve socialist core values, of which one of the values is patriotism. So we can see that ethics is shifting,、uh, can be shifted into the political very easily. And we can see here that the obviously political is being replaced by the ethics. And I want to make a special point about it. You can see that it's being done by force.、Uh, it's obvious because of the context I've told you.、Uh, you but if we were reporters. Uh, who didn't know any of this context, we might not realise. We would have clues that we might see something is wrong. The clothes they are wearing, their national dress, they would never be wearing this normally. They are made to wear this、uh, because of the photographers. That was even the case for my students when I was briefly allowed to teach in Tibet. Whenever a photographer came, they had to wear national clothes. The fact that they dance in their desks, obviously, that signals to us to something about the artificial. The fact that they sing in Chinese, not their own language, we can see clues here, but they're not very strong clues of force, but they're indicators. We can see another clue: absence of Chinese. There are no ethnic Chinese in the classroom. This is part of the manufacturing of consent. So we get a sense here that something is happening. But if we didn't have knowledge of this situation in advance, the knowledge that they're actually in a kind of prison, we probably would take this as normal. We might even take it as relativist, a state that educates its students about ethics in a rather forceful way. In fact, that's how the world has basically viewed China for the past 30, 40 years. So we have a problem in recognizing the political nature of ethics. And finally, I want to say one thing: this concept of pre-crime. This is a concept that comes really from AI. It suggests that what is happening here is the collection of data to make a training set for future modelling of ethical divergence by individuals、uh, in the Uyghur Turkic population, and that the million people in the camps are being used to develop that algorithm. The reason I want to stress that is because we can associate that with China, we can associate it with authoritarianism, but actually. That is our future in all our societies: the politicisation of ethics, the use of ethics as a delivery for political outcomes through a mechanistic model of、uh, of the mind and of uh, of a, uh, the use of AI is probably going to come to all of us. Thank you, Robbie. And we're almost out of time, but I would like to finish with a question to all of you that stemmed from some of the remarks that you made、uh, up there. And it was an issue that was mentioned in, in more than one、uh, panels that came before us:、uh, the rise of AI,、uh, the rise of、uh, big data, and, 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 and predictive、uh, patterns about、uh, one's behavior or a community's behavior. To what there, there seems to be a, a worry that. You know, as you also expressed it, that these patterns will come to d- define and create a self-fulfilling prophecy about how people、uh, behave, and that what is lacking is,、uh, you know,、uh, education, as Sunitha would say, or, or, or social literacy, or an understanding of sociology, so to speak. But、uh, are we so confident that these、uh, algorithms, these,、uh, this crunching of big, big data, does not, in fact, show Patterns that are not fake, but the, but on which we need to take、uh, a different type of approach outside the box to, to to break away from them. I mean, are we absolutely certain that the picture that they present to us is a fake picture? Well, this probably、uh, I'm sure. I think the others should answer too. But And I would I'm、yeah. sorry, I would ask that everyone answers in、mm-hmm. 40 seconds, so to speak, so that we're done. I think we're going to find out that.、Uh, 
the issue is fundamentally one about whether we want a mechanistic explanation of society and of the human mind, or whether we are going to resist that and look for individual difference and individual agency. The AI model will produce you mechanistic answers, and it's already happening in the American justice system. It's being used for bail assessment and for sentencing. They're using AI to identify at-risk populations. These are models which are not to do with people. They're to do with mathematical constructions by people who are not part of the populations that they uh, isolate and penalize. So it, there's several questions embedded in, in, in this particular problem, and one would be, um, uh, is it accurate, right? C can it actually have the predictive power? And if it does, do we want to go there? I mean, it seems that those are two very different kinds of questions. But it goes back to this, the other point that I was making that we had earlier about this, is, this would be a great example of the so-called pluralism Right, where you could, I mean, this is, I mean, I, again, I keep, have to remember that I'm not back in the United States, but the, um, the, the whole development of the, um, the, the, ah, the travel, the, the TSA, I don't even know what it stands for anymore, but the, um, all of the, the regulations right for after 9-11, after that, you know, the whole um, debate between freedom versus security, right? So clearly, I live in a society where clearly on the one hand, they talk out of one side of their mouth about freedom, but all of the TSA is about security, right? Fake or not, promise, you know, whether it can fulfill it or not, right? There's clearly a view that we actually value or think we value security over freedom, right? And so that's a case of those kinds of um, conflicting values. And of course, the movie, the Minority Report, is, yeah. I mean, it was hard not to think of this as science fiction, you yeah. know, coming true or, you know, something along those lines. But, but the whole issue of mechanism, I think, is exactly right. You know, the, um, you never, you don't, I mean, which is presumably why you're punished for something you've done as opposed to something you might do, unless you're talking about a conspiracy to commit a crime where there's some kind of evidence that you are actually planning it. But the idea that um, at any moment you could change, right? Even if the algorithm predicts that you might do something, at any moment thinking about the conversation um, between the previous moderator and the person who jumped him, right? And Hopefully, the person went on not then to go jump the next person, right? That he may have actually thought that at any moment you could change. That's presumably what it Very means to be example. human. Susan? So we use AI all the time. We call it machine learning. That's the same thing. And we use it because it allows us to do millions of experiments at the same time as opposed to one at a time. So it's an incredibly um, powerful tool. But what we see now, and it's going to be really powerful for personalized medicine, precision medicine, and for predictive diagnostics, but what we see happening is AI being used and lots of companies being funded, um, separated from the biology of individuals, and actually it isn't just the data, it's the data in combination with our biology, and, and our biology is going to determine whether you know, a, a particular mutation that looks horrible in the data actually does anything at all. So I look at it from a, it's a tool. Um, I think these other issues and, you know, sort of more of a Orwellian um, future are all real and, and incredibly horrible, and I don't know how you put Facebook back in the box, you know? <laughs> um, but for us, it's great. Okay. Effie? Well, just to add that, um, I think my worry a little bit with AI is that it does has its incredible potential to give us solutions for, for certain things, is the way a probability, because that's what we get, the probability lends um, credibility to a particular, uh, to some agents to do certain things that they want to do and, and sustain a narrative. For example, marginalized populations may have a higher, um, we can find higher crime rates in those populations. Okay, what's the solution? The prediction is the solution and then incarcerate them, preempt the end of the action. That is not the solution. And that can give the opportunity, I think, to certain actors to go away um, from what would be the actual solution. So create possibilities for these people to not be marginalized, you know, to, be, to having other opportunities. So I am a little worried because I think when it's applied in other aspects of life, it has, to me, for me, it, has, it can bring about that, that kind of harm. So um, it's a great tool. It has to be used very, very carefully. Closing remark by Robbie. Um, in fact, in the context of politics and these other issues outside pure science, it doesn't matter if it's correct or not. AI will be accepted as effective. It will put, in this case, 
thousands of people in prison because of the algorithm. It doesn't matter to the state if that is the wrong people or not. It will happen anyway. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Good afternoon to everybody. Uh, we are the last session. Congratulations for making it this far. Um, we are going to talk about inequality and uh, we have three wonderful speakers so I'm going to keep this brief and I'm just going to throw a few thoughts out there uh, prompted by some of the things I've been hearing earlier today and then I'm going to turn it over to the three speakers to speak for several minutes each and then we'll have a general discussion. I was struck from the opening uh, speech, the keynote speech, um, that there was, and I think characteristic of, of our day, a, a, a certain uh, anti-institutionalism, a certain oppositionality to state power, to seeing governments as things that are bad, uh, the new power actually as something good, uh, spontaneous, motivated by people coming together. And uh, now if one thinks about inequality, we're living in a time of growing inequality that's taking us back to levels that haven't been seen for a hundred years. And uh, I'm, I'm a historian, so I can't help thinking about things in this way. What's very striking to me is that uh, at least in, in Europe and in the United States, in the course of that century, there was a very remarkable diminution of inequality over 50 or 60 years. And that inequality was precisely the moment in which the institutions of old power gained power. Governments, ministries, unions, political parties, their flourishing coincided with the diminution of inequality. So here's a first thought for us when we talk about all the benefits of new power and the suspicions that we have towards the state, are we proposing some kind of new solution for new times or are we in fact part of the problem? So that's my first thought. The second is a more ethical uh, consideration and that is what's wrong with inequality? The, the title of our session presupposes that this inequality is a bad thing. But in fact, for hundreds of years, nobody has thought that. They think it now. Why exactly is inequality a bad thing? Uh, and I think the answer to that question uh, will help us if we want to tackle inequality. I happen to think inequality is a bad thing, but for certain reasons that might not be shared by others. So the, the question of inequality seems to be a complicated one, not a simple one. And with that, I'll hand over to our speakers, starting with Professor Carol Glass. Inequality is a bad thing. Okay. Uh, when I started to think about this conference, which is called Untitled, and the world that I live in is partly global. I'm chair of the Committee on Global Thought at Columbia, and it's specifically Asian. Uh, and the first thing that came to mind is that if we're going to untitle we could start with the abstractions that do so much 
covering and concealing work, among them words like globalization or Africa as if it were one country or the global south as if it were one place or populism which covers a multitude or refugees and we've heard that today and now I would add another covering word and that's technology. These are words that strike me as very abstract uh, and they don't help you get to any chance, I think, of retitling and then doing something about inequalities if you're so minded. Uh, it's particularly, I think, salient for an audience like this. We have a lot of people here who are really doing something about inequality and you've heard there and we have some right here. <laughs> uh, but there's a lot more people who are in our positions of privilege which in the subtitle to this session says that we are standing on the backs of others, which is true, uh, whether they're backs of others who are global or the backs of others who are local. Uh, too many of us in this privileged position, and this is, a, this is an, if you like, an, a self-critique, that we as elites, we recognize inequality, we analyze inequality, we agonize over inequality, but we don't do enough about it and partly I think it's because we do take refuge in these covering abstractions. Uh, the, so we need to, I think, rename and specify. We have lots of specifics. We know about economic inequality and the, the top 1% having 45% of the world's wealth and 70 million refugees now an all-time high, whether you call them stateless persons or or misplaced persons. We, we have the details, but those are abstractions too. And what I did here today was the suggestion that one thing we can do is realize that we are talking about real, live, living, breathing, some barely, I must say, human beings who have names and faces. They have voices and stories, as we've heard before, and attending to those, uh, to that, to those people as people would help, I, I think, a bit with the abstraction. But then, how do you attend to them? Uh, empathy came up quite a lot. Well, I'm an Asianist, and the word that comes to, came to my mind, and today it was mentioned as well, uh, I thought first of Charles Darwin, who talked about the moral sense, sympathy, and of Mencius, who is the, the greatest uh, Confucian thinker after Confucius, who talked about compassion and his very famous example about there is no person who would not run to save a child who has fallen into the well. Now interestingly enough, both Darwin who called the moral sense an instinct and Mencius who called compassion a moral beginning, both thought that this sense was innate. That it was, if you use the word today, it was hardwired to use Raphael's word. Uh, but that it was just the beginning and that it was the human, the task of the human, if you like, the moral obligation of the human, the responsibility of a human being to develop those. So Mencius' beginnings were actually a word which means sprouts. If you don't tend them, they won't grow. If, if you tend compassion, it becomes humaneness, which is the highest virtue in the Confucian moral cosmos. And in Mencius' terms, if you don't tend them, you are not a human being. You do not fulfill those, that, that obligation. And Darwin took his uh, moral sense and sympathy to, as far as altruism. So they also both recognized that it was easier. They didn't use the word easy. Neither of them deal with easy. Uh, but they used the word natural. It was more natural to be compassionate and sympathetic to those near you, to your family and those close to your tribe, your community. But the challenge today is to feel that compassion and act on it to those who live in what one person once called a faraway pond. These are people who are going hungry around the globe, being cast off from their homes into camps, or living right around the corner in our own towns like the people in Alexander's great play called Beyond Caring to whom we pay no moral attention, 
who are invisible to us as we sit in beautiful auditoria like this. Sorry. Uh, so the obligation somehow, it seems to me, is first to pay moral attention, but second, you have to do something about it, and that's a lot harder. And I don't really know what to say. I would just say very briefly that it would, be, it would help all of us if we made our own decisions, which, by the way, are what create these systems, these structures, these capitalisms. These are made by political decisions. So are the states and the institutions. They are not God-given. And neither Darwin nor Mencius thought that the state, <laughs> state was God-given. So our own decisions make these things that we ascribe you know, as system. So we can make our decisions on the basis of uh, sympathy and compassion rather than self-interest and reason, uh, but that's obviously not enough. So what I come away with today preliminarily is simply choose some inequality that you want to do something about. Now, both of my colleagues are doing that. Uh, I like to think I'm doing that to some extent too, and I would take now from the today a very nice set of injunctions. One, I think, is to take the less good idea and do the right real thing. It would be a start. Wes. Thank you so much. Uh, um, and I, I tell you, I, I, there, there's, there's so much that, um, that I want to just piggyback on and just say amen from that. Um, you know, and, and I think what the, the hardest thing about this, this issue of, of, of inequality is that I think, to be honest, we also have to acknowledge that it's intentional. Uh, we've asked for this level of inequality within our society by the decisions that we have made. We've asked for this level of inequality by the political decisions, by what we choose to pay attention to, by the level of suffering that we are tolerable, that other people can, can endure. Um, and I think as we talk about how then do we address this level of inequality, and I think it does go back to a core question, I mean, you're absolutely right, do we fundamentally want to address this level of inequality? But my answer to that comes back to it is that it has to be a resounding yes, and it has to be a resounding yes for a couple distinct and important reasons. Uh, one, it does go back to the basic human and moral reason. For us understanding and us being able to, to, to believe in this basic idea that if you have so many people who are starting so far behind, that their trajectory, that their pathway is so difficult and to no fault of their own, that there is a moral, human, fundamental obligation to be able to address that. And to be very honest and to be very frank, if we're talking about the levels of inequality that we see, whether it is levels of racism, sexism, xenophobia, homophobia, you put all the different things lined up, that the only way we can address inequality, you cannot go from inequality to neutrality. That we actually have to be aggressive and progressive when it comes to actually addressing the levels of inequality. You can't ask people to start from far behind and then say, well, you know, we'll, just, we'll make it even now and think that that's somehow going to be enough. But there also comes back something about this idea that the level of trauma that inequality and poverty then sees within our, within our large society and the idea that that's never just going to be their problem. That this will erupt. And we've already seen very distinct and core instances of it. Uh, you know, and if, you, if I can just take a, take a look at, you know, at my hometown of, of Baltimore, Maryland within the United States, and I know there's a lot of you know, my fellow Hopkins, you know, Hopkins friends, Hopkins alum here. Um, but Baltimore, Maryland is a city that is, you know, just an extraordinary part of American history. Uh, you know, the, the, the Star Spangled Banner, the American song was written in Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, legends from American culture and history were born and raised within Baltimore, Maryland. And Baltimore, Maryland also currently, as we speak, according to uh, Dr. Raj Chetty's report from Opportunity Insights, is the worst place in America to be born black, male, and poor. Where you have the lowest prospects for long-term success if you are black, male, and poor and happen to be born in Baltimore, Maryland. And then around five years ago, when after a, uh, uh, an, an incident involving police 
and a young man named Freddie Gray happened and the entire world community saw because the entire world media community descended upon Baltimore uh, as a young man made eye contact with police after he was arrested. An hour later, he was in a coma. And a week later, he died. And there was about a week-long protest that took place demanding accountability, demanding answers as to why this young man died in police custody, and which were all generally peaceful protests until one night on April 27th of 2015, the protests were no longer peaceful. And I remember speaking with a, a, a good friend of mine who's a, who's a minister in Baltimore. And he, he said, do me a favor, he said, uh, and we were talking about police accountability and police, you know, policing reforms. A and to be clear, there need to be some very clear policing reforms. And this is not just a Baltimore nor a United States issue, because oftentimes we're asking police to cover up for other structural issues. And we're talking about policing reform. And he says to me, he says, do me a favor. Next time you get in, a, in front of a computer, go to YouTube and look up Freddie Gray's arrest. And I told him, I said, because it's all over the internet. And I told him, I said, I've seen that video a hundred times. I don't need to see it again. And he said, I understand your point. He said, do me a favor though. Next time you get in front of a computer, go to YouTube and look up Freddie Gray's arrest again. But next time you look at the arrest, don't look at Freddie. And don't look at the police officers. Look at everything else. Look at that neighborhood that the video was shot in. Look at the homes in the background. Look at the fact that that video was shot at 9.17 in the morning and how many people were just standing around. Not on the way to work, not on the way to school. Standing there. And his larger point was this. He was basically telling me, if you're not willing to address the macro, you have no right to mourn the micro. His larger point was saying that every message that we send to children and people who have to endure the weight of inequality by the air that they breathe, by the water that they drink, by the food that they eat, by the homes that they live in, we're sending a very clear statement about whether or not we take this seriously or not. And so this ability to not just delve into a very human and moral sense, but frankly, the best way to protect our futures is to make sure that everyone feels like their futures are being protected as well. Because if not, that will be felt and it will be shared. Well, amen, first of all. Um, I'm quite moved by what I've just heard. Not least because I think a question that has come up time and time again today has been this very living question what can I do? What, from my privilege, from my position of uh, authority, or what can I do? And why do I feel this indifference? Because let's not lie, we are indifferent, and we should be ashamed, and that's okay. Something can come from that. I was quite touched by what my, my friend Brian Dury said earlier around recognizing blame. It doesn't mean kind of falling into the old ideas around guilt, Catholic nonsense or whatever. No, it's around accepting that perhaps if we can truly see something, and I'll get to my point as a theater maker, perhaps the technical team could do me a favor. Hello. Would you mind turning on the lights in the house, please? The house lights for the audience. When you do that, I'll keep speaking until you do that. Thank you very much. The root of the word theatre, ah, hello, nice to see you. It's so much richer when we can actually risk seeing each other. There's a terrible habit in the theatre of the comfort of sitting back in a chair. That's going on over there. So embedded in the architecture of the theatre, embedded in what we've been doing today, is a separation. This separation has to be broken. How? Well, I think we should try. The root of the word theatre is, excuse my pronunciation, theatron, which means seeing place. In the work that I do, I work with actors, great national theatre actors and whatever, alongside people who are not actors, who 
together with my friends, we've trained. I work with cleaners, homeless parents and their children, and now I'm working with women whose children have been taken away from them by the social services, alongside disabled community theatre groups and children. Why do I do this? I'm not interested in, um, I'm not doing community theatre. I'm instead seeking this very basic truth that from other two different, as Oscar said earlier, two different points of view can emerge a third thing. We are here, you are there, and in between us is where the theatre is possible. So if you'll allow me, I think it's the last session of the day, so let's risk something together. Do you agree? So what we're going to do is, you're going to all need to, you're all going to need to do, it's a very small thing, it's very basic, but you're all going to need to do it for it to have any meaning whatsoever. So if you don't all participate, we'll collapse. I'm going to ask you in a moment, we're going to have a short silence, and then you're all going to stand up. Please stand up. We too, yes. Why not? And we're going to do a very basic exercise, and it's going to be okay for you to laugh, if, but please try and work together. I would like you in a moment, without speaking, please, if you have the urge to speak, think about something else. But if you could please be so kind, you're going to turn to somebody that you do not know, and you're going to look at their face. We'll do it in a minute with each other. Find somebody you don't know and really look at them. Somebody you don't know that's close to you and please make eye contact with them. Okay, let's just have silence, please. Silence, please. And what you're going to do now is for the next two minutes, you're going to very simply do something that is so essential to our humanity, which is you're going to imagine, you're going to do some work, you're going to imagine, looking at this person's face, you're going to see them as a six-year-old child. So just look at their face, and whatever images come, you might have a whole novel, you might be bored, but risk, risk truly looking at somebody and seeing them as a six-year-old. Go. You can stop there. <laughs> Thank you for doing that. Okay, you can sit back down now. That's the face I was using to, to sort of bring you back. 
All right, okay. The experiment is not over. Well, that shook you up a little bit. It's a nice... The purpose of that is very simple. It's very simple, and then I'll shut up. Seeing place, you looked at one another. This is a basic drama school exercise, perhaps. But equally, it inside it is a very simple idea, which is there's a miracle in another human being and that each human being has untold riches. I think that one of the problems that we have is that we amalgamate. We don't listen. Someone is not simply one category over another. Someone is not simply a worker, a have-not, a victim. Identity is a multifaceted, complex, rich poem. And perhaps one of the things that we need to do, and I'm not a politician or anything like that, but. I'm a person, a worker of the theatre, is we need to look more carefully. And perhaps some of you are moved, perhaps some of you think I'm wasting your time, that's okay. Unfo luckily this event is free as far as I know, so there's no refunds. Um, I'll be quiet now, but I just want to end my intervention by saying the answer is very simply in each other. It's not as complicated as all that. It's to start with that very simple effort. Try something. Risk something. It's very hard to follow that. Um, I, I won't really try, but... Uh, uh, um, well, no, I don't think it was nonsense. It raised one question that I did want to ask you about, which was, uh, which was raised by Carol, and it's implicit, I think, in both your work, Wes, and your work, Alex, to a certain extent. Um, and that is, to the extent that we see what we're doing, as part of a seeing others for who they are, as part of a, an attempt to grapple with our own privileged status. Um, your experiment required us to be in close proximity to somebody, very close. So there's a question here. Carol is, I think, urging us in some way to work towards a more globalized sense of empathy that would not be confined to those people that we can see. It would start with us seeing those that we can see. Um, the theater is an intimate experience. It gains its power from that intimacy. Uh, whereas your, your programs are, are, as I understand it, chiefly American in focus. There is a sense that we help a certain population doesn't mean we're indifferent to the others, but those are whom we help. So I suppose one question that I would be interested in uh, for, for each of you is, um, is there anything wrong with making these divisions, with starting with the people that are nearest to us? Is there something wrong with that? Should we be aspiring for a more universal sense of empathy? May I let Mencius answer that? Okay. Mencia says very clearly and that you start with the relation between parents, child and parents, and then brothers and sisters, and he goes on, and then the community, and, and there's this out, you start close in, you extend, and then he says very clearly, and then all men are brothers, which is a very strong statement. But what he claims is by starting and he's not the only one, by starting close in and practicing, you have to do, you have to act. It's not, you have to build, you have to develop. By practicing those virtues, uh, which are social virtues, and also self-development virtues. This is called self-development in Confucianism. That's how you get to what you were calling universal until all men are brothers. Um, just very briefly about the theatre. Theatre is, I think, that my colleagues in the theatre, of which there are a few here today, would agree, is a simultaneously the most intimate and the most public thing ever. <laughs> so, you know, this is extremely public and yet extremely intimate. Um, and what you describe is precisely the... I, 
when I do a play, I think that it starts with one such contact like we've just explored, and then it grows to a few more people, and a few more people, and then finally meets the audience. Um, but it's this thread of quality of exchange, quality of, of thought, quality of personal investment, that whatever one is doing, be it theater or politics or social work or education or family relationships, we need to go beyond the simple um, mind-numbing associations. I mean, even some of the words that are bandied about by people, like the word shared values or common co things we have in common. Uh, you know, these, as you were saying so eloquently earlier, um, these simplistic sort of amalgamations uh, are our enemy in some ways because what common good? This is what people were was used to manipulate people into going off to fight. And it was to say you'd go and fight some enemy that you don't know because, you, because you're fighting for the common good and the shared values. And I ask you, whose values? Boris Johnson's? No, thank you. I mean, you know, it's a real... Um, yeah, that's coming up soon. So it's a real, um, it's a real constant challenge to be, to be, to be truthful, I guess. I um, uh, first, I want to say very, very briefly. I, I was, I was really moved actually by this exercise, Alex. And um, part of it was I, I got a chance to really put myself and see and experience what you were at six. Um, and then part of that time. Uh, I have, a, uh, I have a now five and a half, almost six year old son. And it forced me to think about how does the world view him? Yes. Yes. Um, and so that was actually, that was a very, um, that was a very powerful exercise. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. I, um, you know, I, I think about actually going back to this point of uh, how do we think about this in terms of, you know, the, uh, our issues versus other issues, et cetera. Um, you know, we all live and exist under a very powerful and interconnected human mosaic uh, that has a whole collection of different things that make up this mosaic. And I, I feel like the way that it was actually de des described earlier uh, about, well, we have to find that things, each of us individually, then makes our heart beat a little bit faster. I think we all have to find that thing and go after that thing. Uh, because this is inherently hard. And the truth is, is that there's not a single issue that any of us are working on that is simple. Because if it was simple, it would have been solved already. The reason that we have to spend our time and our days and our lives working on these things is because they are by their nature difficult. And they're by their nature entrenched. And so it's gonna require everything that we've got to be able to make an impact on that thing. And so I actually, would, I actually would, would, would argue that while we need to have a basic sense of elementary compassion for all these variety of issues, and I think that's important, and I think, again, that's the thing that makes us human, the thing that we should focus on is that thing that we know that makes our heart beat a little bit faster. Because if we're all then going to focus on those things in our, each of our individual lanes, that's how we create a better human mosaic. But if we then, but if we think that we can then spend a little bit of time on a whole collection of different issues, that's where we run into the problem of now never actually addressing any of them. Because we're just dealing on surface on things that are far deeper and far more entrenched than that. So here's, here's a question from, from the floor. Uh, much of the work that many of us do exists because of the systems that create and perpetuate inequality and the foundations that fund this work exist often because of the structures that they employ to make wealth on the back of others. Is there not a role for these foundations to create new structures, break the old structures and advance new ones, and do this as partners with those suffering from these inequalities? The foundations to create what? New structures to break the old ones and advance new structures. Let me take that first. I, I, don't, I don't think there's a role, I think there's an obligation. I really do. I, I, I mean, you know, we're not where we are because found, philanthropy hasn't done its job, <laughs> right? We're not where we are because philanthropy just needs to work harder. Ph ph philanthropy has to, has to understand the structures in which, and, and the systems in which we exist. And that philanthropy can play a catalytic role 
Philanthropy can play a philanthropy can play an innovative role. Philanthropy can be lead capital on things, but philanthropy alone is not going to address structure. Philanthropy's job is actually to penetrate and break up structure. You know, I, I think about it in respect to uh, you know take the the American criminal justice system, for example. Uh, you know, the Robin Hood Foundation, the, the foundation that I run, we we fund everything from education, to housing, to food, to shelters, to criminal justice reform. We fund some of the best job training programs around and we use data to be able to reinforce the efficacy of our programs and our programmatic work. But I tell you, here's the truth. One of the first visits that I took when I became the CEO of Robinhood was we spent the day over in Rikers Island, which is one of the largest penitentiaries, one of the largest prison facilities within the United States. And I spent time with some of our job training programs, people who are working with people who are soon to be released as they're giving them job skills, et cetera. Um, and it was one of the first moments that I sat there in this role of philanthropy that I realized that there's really only but so much you can do from this seat. Because the truth is, is that you can give people the best job training programs in the world, but when they come home and they are not allowed to compete for many federal and state jobs because they have a felony record. When they come home and every time they fill out an application for a job, they have to check a box reminding them of their felony record. And by the way, people who have to check boxes are 75%, uh, there's 75% chance that they will now no longer complete the application because psychologically they've been eliminated. Or you can tell them they can apply for colleges, but you have to check a box on that as well. And by the way, if you get accepted to college, you're not allowed to apply for things like Pell Grants and scholarships, which would actually help you pay for it. Philanthropy can't fix that. So I think that philanthropy's job in all of this is philanthropy has got to use not just its capital, but has got to use its voice and its leverage to be able to break structures. Because if not, we're just continuing to throw good money after bad and frankly, making ourselves and our work part of the larger problem that exists of inequality and separation. But wasn't... I, I completely agree, but wasn't the, the, the job of breaking structures formerly the, uh, the, the business of a certain kind of politics? Wasn't that exactly what a certain kind of politics was supposed to do? Yeah. And so I guess what I'm asking, in, we've had a very ethical discussion. We've been talking about how Let's we must become better. We've been talking about how it starts with just looking at one person. Self-betterment is going to be the first step towards tackling inequality. But that may be an infinitely long road. And there was a time not so long ago where alongside that, People thought that is the job of a certain kind of politics to reform prison systems, to deal, to take a question that has come up with economic inequality. We haven't actually talked about the extent to what, which what we are advocating and what we are doing uh, is, is something, it is a response to these predicaments, but is it all the response that is required? And what is the role of politics uh, as far as we can see in, in tackling these kinds of issues? I can have a quick, quick go. I mean, I'm not a politician but, uh, or a political expert, but my, my impression is I'm reminded quite vividly of the great playwrights I mean, who have written so powerfully about the way the young, the new generations are betrayed by the older generations, like Romeo and Juliet, who inherit the debt of grudge, the debt of hatred, and so many countless examples. I could get all nerdy about you know, playwriting, but I won't. The, the one thing I'd say now is that in my country, 160,000 people, most of whom are of retirement age, are going to vote for our new prime minister to enact uh, a policy that was voted for in large part by people who won't be around to see its full effects. So the truth is the young right now do not see, and I count myself amongst, we do not see a clear path for hope. And the answer, I think, is, you know, politics, yes. But the problem is that a lot of people have grown completely disillusioned with politics and democracy. It's, it's currently, for all the reasons, you know, earlier I, I disagreed respectfully with the discussion earlier around the, um, 
around the new power and the old power because the new power is owned and in the hands entirely of the tech companies, which are, I don't think, I think they are the, the sort of, the, you know, the, the, the motors of disagreement and, and generalization and, and actually increase the studies that have shown that they increase the way that we band together with people that are like us. I would say the future lies in radical experiments in people with people that are different. We need to create conditions in which we can be confronted with what we consider to be different. Not to realize that we're all the same, but to realize that the true richness of life lies in collaboration, in confrontation, and not in simply agreeing. Agreeing is extremely boring. Far more interesting is, and the, you know, again, I'm not, in, I'm not working in the sphere of words, I'm working in the sphere of many ways silence, the theater, the possibility of life, of truly sensing life in all its ambiguity. And we need life because right now, I think, you know, that's a bit a cry for life. There's nothing shameful about that. And I'm afraid that's perhaps naive, but, you know, naivety sometimes is good. If you think of the things that have changed, big changes, like the abolition of slavery and what that took, or the legalization of gay marriage and what that took, uh, or uh, countless other things. And things don't always move in a progressive direction. They can turn backward. But look at the politics with a small p that's involved in that. It, you need a lot. It takes more than a village. You need a lot of people. And here's where philanthropy can use its considerable authority to, as a pressure, as a lever, as a rabble rouser kind of thing. This is the, the and by, by pressing, by, by using leverage and by rabble rousing, yes, I think philanthropy has a real role to play in breaking up structures. This I would call politics. Yeah. It's, it then makes an impact on the capital P politics I think you're referring to. But take a look at how things have changed and take a look at why the, the American incarceration system hasn't changed. One of the shames of the universe in terms of a society that thinks of itself as, as advanced. So politics, yes, but a different kind of politics. And the kind of politics that you're actually doing and that you're actually doing. And, I, and, I, and, I, and just to add on to that, I think where the politics becomes incredibly important is when we, when we look at the level of disillusionment yeah. that has grown uh, within our larger societies and the decisions that have been made because of that level of disillusionment, again, not by accident. When we have people who are, who are not just, in, you know, not just uh, uh, bellowing but encouraging people the idea that government is not there to serve you, government doesn't help you, and therefore then you will get decisions that will be made that will basically protect us from government you will get elected officials in there who will run on campaigns of draining the swamp, right? The thing about that, though, is when we understand the systems and structures that government have helped to create, the only way we're going to actually really be able to push those levers and push those politics, both small p and capital P, is for government to be able to take a strong and aggressive lead to be able to address these things. And so part of what we then have to do is not just, it's not about this idea of, of, an, of emboldening bad government, but it's encouraging participation that we can force good government and enforce a government that's actually going to be responsive and a government that is actually going to then help enable this larger breakup of some of these systems and structures that, again, have been built up by intention because there are certain things and certain inequities that exist because people are asleep. And that's what, that's what allows these things to grow and fester. So wake up. On, on, on that note, uh, I would like to thank our three really wonderful panelists for their contribution. Thank you. I'd like, um, I'd like to thank you all for coming, and I'd like to thank the Stavros Niarchos Foundation for giving us a most wonderful and thought-provoking day. See you tomorrow. If you can bear with us for three more minutes, we would like to show you a short video, a three-minute video, with the work of Silk Lab.
um, which you can experience outside in the lobby because it's really, really unique. Color sensors are very simple and very coarse on their own. But the moment that you duplicate them and the moment that you distribute them, they give an accurate reading of what is happening in a complex context like your body. There are two components to this. One is to have all of these active inks that can be printed on a large scale, on a shirt, on a tapestry, painted on the walls, etc. And these biologically active inks will change color. What these colors do is that they provide a continuous painting that updates and changes its response as a function of the athlete's progression through exercise. The idea is that we use three different uh, colorimetric dyes that they switch color in different pH ranges in a way that we can actually build a color map of what's happening in the body. Okay, I'm gonna spray pH 3. And now I'm gonna spray pH 8 on this area. By having a simple color change in the different areas, we are able in real time to detect what is happening actually in our sweat and correlate that information to what's happening inside our body. So by looking at analyzing the local color change in each of the areas and comparing them to a database of spectral signatures that one has, one can reconstruct a lot of information about the content in sweat, whether it's ions, whether it's the presence of lactic acid for fatigue, having localized temperature measurements, and so forth. I think that the advantages are that you can tailor the training depending on your body's response. You know when to stop. You know if there is an affected area of your body that needs more attention than others. And, and these colors can reflect the health of a person, the vitality of the person, the mood, the, the well-being of communities. Color sensors are looking inwards, and so they take what the body puts out and then they react to it, but they also look outwards, so they react also to what comes from the environment. So if you go beyond the human body and you go and you think about putting these inks on curtains or tapestries, then the tapestries and the curtains will change color in response to the changing environment around them. The fact that we have these living materials and we have these living inks means that we can turn anything into a sensor. If you can embed life and if you can embed chemistries in ordinary objects, the ordinary objects become communicators of the world changing around us. So God forbid me keeping you here any longer after a long day. I just want to say Nick, a scientist from our lab, is here. The tapestries are hanging outside. You can interact with them. Uh, you also have a swatch from the tapestries. It's just one of the multiple forms that you can get for new interactions and reshaping nature, um, as we talked about today. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you for staying with us. Uh, this was a very long day and we have another one coming up tomorrow. We're looking forward to seeing all of you tomorrow here again at 9 a.m. Thank you very much. Okay, the first day of the conference uh, is completed here. I would like to thank you all. See you tomorrow, the second day of the conference at 9 o'clock. But uh, I would like to thank Dina Argyropoulou. Thank you so much. Dina has been recording graphic design, all the interesting discussions, and she will also be with us tomorrow. Goodbye, see you tomorrow, and thank you.